what is the price of being an independent thinker so listen the world is complex and we often don't have the time to figure out everything for ourselves often we rely on conventional wisdom that's a rational option but it also means that we fall into grooves of thinking set by others as that old saying goes where we stand depends on where we sit you could be born in a religious family in a small town in up and imbibe those values you like your people you want to belong and so you become one of them your conservative their other is your other you soak in all their values if you're a woman and being modest and demure is prized you become modest and demure an independent thinker in that environment would be a heretic and even considered a bad person similarly if you're studying in an american university there will be pressure on you to be woke and to me wokeness is the opposite of liberalism wokeness begins where liberalism ends as a classical liberal i put the individual at the center of my thinking wokeness embraces group identities and simplistic narratives of victimhood and oppression with that one hammer for every nail again if you dissent do so silently or you could be in trouble these are just two examples of group think but all around us in every domain in every workplace there is a pressure to conform i've never conformed and neither has my guest on this show today he knows there is a price to be paid for dissenting from the herd you may never find your tribe and you may always be alone but you can't change who you are it is what it is welcome to the seen and the unseen our weekly podcast on economics politics and behavioral science please welcome your host amit varma Welcome to the scene and the unseen. My guest today is a formidable Eric Weinstein who happened to be in Mumbai a few days ago and when he reached out to say he'd like to meet, I took the chance to invite him on the show. Eric got his PhD in mathematical physics, went on to be a hedge fund director and is today a prominent public intellectual. Those of us who listen to podcasts would be familiar with him from his many appearances on Joe Rogan's show Lex Friedman Super Podcast and Eric's own podcast Supportal. He coined the term the intellectual dark web and has been at the center of many controversies. because he has questioned many orthodoxies we don't discuss any of them in this conversation i found him to be a warm gentle person and i wanted to explore the man not the public figure so we had a beautiful personal insightful and intimate conversation which was shorter than either of us would have liked because he had a bit of a troubled day a family member was in hospital and he still took out time to give me i'll always cherish this conversation but before we get to it let's take a quick commercial break Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end. of it the course costs rupees 10000 plus gst or about 150 dollars if you're interested head on over to register at indiauncut.com/clearwriting that's indiauncut.com/clearwriting being a good writer doesn't require god given talent just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills i can help you eric welcome to the scene and the unseen i really appreciate it good to be with you amit So before I ask my first question if you'll indulge me with an anecdote which may seem unrelated yesterday I was chatting with a poet friend of mine named Vartika and she told me about her dad who, who's in his late 60s and uh, she said how he had a you know pretty conventional career as a zoology teacher and all of that but after retiring he's gotten into the zone where he's trekking around he's backpacking everywhere he'll visit her in bombay and then the fancy will strike him and he'll go off somewhere else and i just found all of that entirely delightful someone living life to the full and then i went to your instagram and i found this picture of yours from 1986 in karjot <laughs> which by the way is interesting because i was in karjot just last week and next week right after recording this i'm going there for a few weeks to try and get some writing done so you know it's like everything coming full circle and i loved your caption of that this is karjot 1986 and you're writing 
टू इयर्स बिफोर आई इन प्रोबेबली मेट माई जूश इंडियन वाइफ टू बी आई एम स्क्रॉनी एंड गॉकी एंड कर्जत महाराष्ट्र आई समा हैव अ बेस्ट फ्रेंड नेम्ड आदिल हु टीच इज मी उर्दू द यूनिवर्स इज लिमिट लेस इन नाइनटीन एटी सिक्स इंडिया अनफोल्ड्स बिफोर मी इन अ सीक्वेंस ऑफ वर्ल्ड विद इन वर्ल्ड्स आई रिमेंबर वंडरिंग विल इंडिया गवर्न माई लाइफ एज इट हैपन्स इट्स सॉट आर डेड एंड सॉट आर डिट एंड इन नो वे कुड आई हैव एक्सपेक्टेड but for a moment in summer 1986 the world seems a limitless adventure and all roads led to india chembur oruvel warwan valley and panjim in particular i never knew that moment of limitless romance would end if you are young i wish such a moment of limitless romance and possibility for you to be wild young and free for after all it cannot last and will come to an end as of course it must stop god and you know i mean of course it will come to an end for all of us when we die but you know why did you feel that limitless romance is kind of gone i'm kind of curious about that because you seem to me from all your uh, you know public appearances to be someone who is free spirited in a certain way you're not tied down by convention and yet there seem this post seem like a very poignant lament to this time of limitless possibility sure first of all that's a cautionary tale about posting after midnight i'm certain that that uh something something must have moved me to say so so much in a public forum it's hard for me to say i i believe that when you're young you don't realize uh, i i have a i have a quote that i don't often share with the world which is that potential is like sperm you're not supposed to use all of it <laughs> so you're given limitless potential but you actually have to particularize it to something uh you're not going to learn all the world's languages nor all of its cities you're not going to have all of the experiences and i think that in 1986 i was completely unprepared for india in particular it's interesting to get to the age of 20 and get hit with an experience of a world that is so powerful that it changes everything about you and one of the one of the things that i find in the states is that people who make india a large part of their life who don't grow up here and who don't have a historical connection to the subcontinent is that they tend to come for spiritual reasons and I, that was not what drew me to india in any way shape or form so i didn't have i've never been to you know varanasi i've never thought myself to have an ancient indian soul i i've always been an outsider but the vitality and the complexity and the cosmopolitan nature of india within india was intoxicating and one of the things that i i liked most about about the experience was was getting hit with the idea that i didn't know how to eat i did not know how to go to the bathroom all of my intuitions were wrong and for, to have that happen to you at the beginning of your 20s and to discover worlds within worlds within worlds is a very powerful thing and, and in particular in the us context we have an illusion which is that if we simply roll up our sleeves and apply some good old american air, elbow grease we can solve the world's problems and india taught me that that was simply impossible that i could spend an entire life on a city block and not understand it here and so the humbling experience of india and the and the the call to adventure and all of these things um it sort of immediately taught me that i did not know what the world was capable of putting up and that there was no way of following all paths but i i felt certain at the time that my life was meant to pass through here and and it it did and it didn't in the ways that i expected it did in the sense that i you know i fell in love with an indian woman and married into her family i continue to have the same best friend from uh, from that time but i never spent a year here i never mastered the language sufficiently um by the the language you know of course that that immediately you know you, just, you say something wrong right out of the blocks but uh i sort of thought hindi and and urdu would have would have gotten i would i would have advanced farther within them but on the other hand i think that the the issues of indian sensibility the the, the interest and the concern with this place has lasted and just in terms of the potential realizing that in every life most of the doors that are open to you must close so that there is no way of of truly living the world you you live a very particular experience and uh, as robert frost said in a poem that almost no one really actually 
understands, you simply take one path over the other and you, you will lie to yourself that the path you t took made all the difference, that your choices did. But in fact, what he was really saying was that there were two paths that were exactly equivalent and he simply took one of them and then he will lie to himself in the future about the fact that he took the one that seemed a little bit less worn. And I, I think that's sort of the genesis of the idea. It was a little bit rambling, but there you go. Yeah, no, the Frost poem is beautiful. I, in fact, teach it in my writing course, or rather I talk about it in the context of how poets use soft sounds and hard sounds, where in the first part of the poem, where the woods are filling up with snow, all the sounds are soft, and just, you know, you get that feeling of that, that softness. That wasn't the poem that I meant, and, but the... Uh, but the Oh, okay. I was with. Uh, I was thinking of the two roads diverging in that's the yellow the wood, one. That's the one. That's but the you one. were thinking of on stopping by the woods in the, on a snowy oh, evening. Oh yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Oh yeah, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and it's right. made all the difference. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, we're thinking of different poems. But but, uh, but in some sense, I've actually thought that those poems seem strangely connected. Yeah, yeah. Which is why I made the error I just did. Well, or or it was perhaps it wasn't an error at all. Perhaps <laughs> it wasn't. So one thing that you just said sort of struck me in the sense that you didn't come here for the typical for the r typical reasons that you know someone from america might come here you didn't come here looking for religion you didn't go to varanasi you didn't come here with that exotic gaze as it were you were just trying to kind of soak it in and i'm wondering how taking this temporary road at that time just coming to india with an open mind yeah. how it changes the person you become because i would imagine that not only would it make you a different person from the person you would have been if you hadn't come yeah. but it would also make you a different person from the person who comes with that exotic gaze and everything is something outside of you and then you go back and it's back to life and all that it's interesting even the concept of the exotic gaze is i think misunderstood and it of course, I could be wrong, but Indians tend to exoticize India themselves. And this issue of the cosmopolitan India from within is not understood. I think that uh, I've seen very few uh, fellow Goras wandering around South Bombay for the last week. On the other hand, it's the most multicultural city you can imagine, even if everyone happens to be Indian. So I think that there's a weird way in which you can't actually escape what you're saying is the exotic gaze, what we typically call Orientalism in the West and the fetishization is in fact an internal fetishization. So that I think that, you, you know, it's once again a, a situation in which if you're really open to the place, it teaches you that you, you can't escape these things. And even if you don't come for the spirituality, the spirituality will come for you. Uh, there's no way to avoid it. So in terms of how to form me and, and how, did, how does it differ from somebody else, I think the key question is, are you open to having uh, your life shaken up without coming to answers? And I think that that's really, that's been an important part of, of India's role in my life, which is that I'm always much more aware of what I don't know, don't understand, feel incompetent to comment upon than... What, what little nuggets of insight I, I can glean. And so I think, I think it's been a tremendously humbling experience. It forces modesty upon you. I'm also struck by the word you used that, you know, you were an outsider here. Mm. And I felt that in pretty much everything I've done in my life, every field I've been part of, I felt like an outsider. I'm not part of the mainstream. I'm doing my own thing. Sure. Might get respect and all that, but an outsider. And I just wonder if there is someone called, I mean, if it's a question of just character or personality that you're just a congenital outsider, like in, in your career from the outside in, just looking at everything you've done, it would seem whether it's in academy or wherever you were, is it correct to say that you were perhaps a little bit of an outsider till me perhaps at a later stage, you know, you you were part of your own little band of outsiders? Yeah. I, I, I believe that it has to do with being an insider and an outsider simultaneously and being open to both roles. If you are simply an insider, it means that you aren't seeking adventure. You're not seeking to break your own frames and reweave them. If you were simply an outsider, you're usually in denial about the fact that you come with a context, even if that context is not well known. And so, you know, as somebody who married into a subculture here, I suppose there are ways in which I'm actually an insider, but... 
I think but, what I'm getting at is not just in the context of India, uh-huh. but is there a certain kind of person who is condemned or destined to always be an outsider just because of the way that you think? Which sure, I mean, I think you know one one of the interesting things, for example, is that in our country, the United States, Barack Obama probably became president because he was perennially outside, so the only choice was to lead, and we perhaps accepted him because he was black and white, he was Muslim and Christian. He was, it turns, you know, foreign, having grown up in Indonesia and American, but, you know, sort of tangentially so, where Hawaii was one of the last states to be admitted to the Union. And he, he had so many different fragments of identity that in some sense he was qualified to lead a nation whose identity was itself fragmented. And so even if the people that he led often had a much more coherent identity, the person who is forever... Well, look, I just had my stum- my stomach defeated by a, a Thali restaurant called Thacker's, right? Which okay. you probably know at Chapati. Yeah. And it's so many different fragments of a meal that, you know, are, are put together on one tray and, and constitute a meal. But, you know, really it's an assault of the senses in which everyone eventually admits defeat. I think in some sense that fragmented identity is an identity and it's a... It's a common enough one, but because everyone's fragments are different, we never meet somebody whose whose shards are similar enough to our own. I remember once seeing a movie called Total Love TLV out of um, Israel, and somehow it wove together India, Israel, and Holland, where we had just been. And my wife and I sort of stared at each other because somehow these shards matched our shards at that moment. Where that, that's a you know it's a tremendously unusual thing to have a fragmented identity match that of another. In another of your Instagram posts, mm-hmm. you, there's a picture of you in 1989 and you're in Kiev, right? And some of your relatives have kind of come over, and this is a very touching picture, and you're looking very young, and you're kind of posing with them, and it's a black and white uh, picture, if I remember. And you talk about how you straight away felt uh, in what was then the Soviet Union. You straight away felt at home. Yeah. Right. I want to ask about what that concept of home is for you. Sure. You know, because for some people it could be a particular place, maybe a particular place at a particular time. For some people there's a larger sense of community that yeah. ties into it. In your case, you're Jewish as well, which plays into all of this. Tell me a little bit about what is your notion of home and what it means to belong. Well, very often it has to do with the things that you've hugged closest to your breast and the shock of finding out that they had an origin in some thing that you did not know. So I remember being in um, in Kiev and finding out that certain sort of Yiddish phrases that had no use or utility in the United States were still used by my relatives over there and sort of the shock of figuring out that people you had never met are actually relatively close family and that the culture did not die and that you you came from a context that you knew not uh, is shocking. And, and by the way, a similar thing oddly happened here where uh, before I met my wife, I really came over to, to be with my friend Adil's family and the Abdulali clan. Um, so we, we happened to be recording uh proximate to, to Bandra, uh, which, which was the home of the great ornithologist uh, Salim Ali, the birdman of India. And the Abdulalis were very active within the Bombay Natural History Society. And they maintained all sorts of forgotten songs that my family, in fact, would sing. They would call these Kahim songs because the family maintained a large compound on the beaches south of Bombay near Alibag. And... I was playing harmonica, which is not an, an instrument that many Americans play, and where it's called mouth organ here. And the patriarch of my of my friend's uh, family, Shamoon Abdulali of blessed memory, it was an instant connection. And the transcendence of the particulars, you know, Jew and Muslim and Indian and American, all this kind of stuff. You just sort of, the superficial identities can sometimes melt away and, and you're left with the deep differences and the deep similarities. And so I, there was no way in which I was part of this 
this family, but I was also accepted because culturally there was a great deal of homology that had been undiscovered. And so I just find these things fascinating that in some sense, the things that we that we value that are not in common currency. See, if, if you value a, uh, a famous Beatles song, if I say I really like the song Yesterday, and you say, oh, I do too, it has no currency because so many people appreciate that song, right? But if I think about like, well, there's a little snippet of a song in Marathi that I didn't know that I've carried with me that Shimon taught me. And that, if somebody knew that, I would feel an instant kinship because it's such an obscure thing that is never referenced anywhere. And I think that, that that's really what in some sense home is, is, is that you're looking for the few things that are really not in strong currency elsewhere that I, that you've held close and anybody else who exhibits those things in general feels like home. There's another beautiful clip from your Instagram. As you can see, I've kind of <laughs> stalked your Instagram. There's another beautiful clip where you're having, which you title Harmonica Duel, but it's not really a duel. It's this beautiful moment where you're walking through the street playing your harmonica and oh. this other gentleman joins you. And it, it just, you know, everything kind of makes sense. You ju It just well, fits it together, funny. right? There was an Avignon in France, in the south of France. And they were having a giant festival, which I hadn't heard of. And there was some black blues and jazz cat in the street that singing with in English, probably an American. And, you know, we have France in some sense to thank for rescuing the careers of so many American black musicians who couldn't earn a living in the States and the French really appreciated. And the French were of course early, maybe the first non-Americans to contribute to the canon. Uh, I'm thinking of Django Re Reinhardt, who was a famous Sinti, a Romani uh, musician, and to a lesser extent, his his fellow musician, Stefan Grappelli. So it was just odd that I was walking through the street and I heard this guy and I had a harmonica in my pocket. I, I tend to travel with a harmonica because I think it, it affords a possibility of making a connection almost anywhere you are. And I checked it and he was playing in a style called cross harp where you don't play with the fourth hole blown as the bass, but you use the second hole drawn. And it was in the same key. And I thought, okay, well, this is clearly Kismet. And we started playing together. We never exchanged a word. But I, I to this day, feel a kinship with this person, like all, all, almost an as if friend. And it's not a friendship in any significant way, but what are the odds that two people in the south of France would both have the same harp, play in the same style, and be able to communicate in uh, under a minute? Uh, it's, it's kind of absolutely magical, and I've realized over time that you might value deep friendships that last many years, and those have their place, but sometimes you can have a chance meeting, just one conversation, and you remember that, or one moment of connection like this. And I want to also ask you about time, which is something I think about, like, I'm in my late 40s, I'm, I think, nine years younger than you. And when I was young, when I was 17 or 18, it seemed as if 40 was really old. You know, you romanticize the rock stars who ride at 27, or then the guys who ride at 33, and you thought, man, that's really old. You know, that's a long way away. And at the same time, while time seems to be very vast, the world seems to be very small and controllable in a sense. It's your oyster. You, you, you feel that you grok everything, you understand everything. And I found that as you grow older, time, one's understanding of time, at least my understanding of time, just changes. Like mm. I was chatting with a guest of mine and I realized that his year of birth was closer to World War One than to his current age, right? And which is so uh, sort of, uh, you know, in your case, they're almost the same. I think you're born in 65, right? So whatever. But 20 years shifted from the end of World War II. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's how does, you know, do you think about this? Like then what happens is earlier when we are young, a century seems like a long time. At this age, a century doesn't seem like such a long time. It seems like just as in many of our cases, the years and the decades can just pass by in a flash. It might feel that a lot of the differences that seem so big are not really big differences, that we are all the same people, we're all coming from the same place. You can find that moment of connection in Kiev, in Mumbai. Yeah. I, I really agree and disagree with this very strongly. I made the point 
I think on the Rogan podcast, maybe the last time, that between 1902 and 1952, it seemed like 10,000 years. But between 1973 and 2023, it's barely any time at all. And I don't think that that has to do with with me. I think that if you look at a picture of 1952 and you look at a picture of 1902, you know, there are no planes flying in 1902 around and cars are an oddity if if they're there at all. Frozen food hadn't really... I mean, so much changed that I brought up that a Civil War veteran lived to see the first hydrogen bomb exploded. Now, that that's extraordinary. If we thought that the same thing would happen between... 1973 and the present, we would be living in a world of the of the Jetsons, that cartoon. And I think one of the things that you're seeing that is really remarkable is the rise of uh, machine learning and AI. And that's going to have a profound impact that is essentially unimaginable. The internet is the big story of the last 50 years. And I'm not going to deny how big of a story it is, but I am going to say that it's not it's not like, like what happened in the Renaissance where you had simultaneously innovations in architecture and music and mathematics and painting and poetry and political thought. I mean, it was just, it was astounding that somehow humanity got out of its own way across the board. And I think that what's odd about the progress of the last 50 years is, is that it's been pretty narrow. It's been pretty narrowly focused on communications and more importantly, digital technology. And, you know, I grew up when I was a little kid with, with a Concorde. We don't have supersonic passenger flight. I think my parents purchased some sort of option to be on Transworld Airlines' first flight to the moon they thought was an inevitability. So there was sort of a, a, you know how when you're very hungry and you go to a a market, you you tend to put too much food in your basket because you you don't realize that your hunger is affecting you. In the 60s, the world seemed much more futuristic. And, And I think that that's gone backwards. And I think it's just now restarting. So I think if you're... If you're thinking about time, there are periods of time where nothing happens and there are periods of time when everything happens. And I think we may be watching the end of a frozen order following World War II. Yeah, I think the quote is something to the effect of there are years when nothing happens and weeks when years happen, which is... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. I, and I think that, you know, I, well, when I first visited India, people had ambassadors and fiats mm. and... I think the Maruti was just, there was an old joke at the time, um, which is horrible. How are, how, how is a Maruti like piles? <laughs> Sooner or later, every asshole gets one. Uh, <laughs> but that was, you know, India was breaking out of its, its formative era as a modern state. And, you know, I see much more change in this society than I do in my own. So let's take a digression and a slightly heretical question, and I'm really thinking aloud here. Careful with the heresy, because this is a pretty combustible place, but let's go to it. <laughs> let's, no, this is, I, I don't think this will piss people off. But uh, So here's my thought, that the number of people who are alive today yeah. uh, is much more than ever before. Mm. So your sample size of potential artists and creators is far greater than yeah. ever before. And the means of production are far more widespread than ever before. Yeah. And therefore, one would logically imagine that when we talk of the Renaissance and so on, we're kind of romanticizing it, that we should have just by the numbers, just by the stats, just by the fact sure. that people are so empowered, a far greater number and quality of artists all over the place. And perhaps they are dispersed and perhaps they're you know catering to little corners and we don't but what is sort of your um, kind of sense of that but that's preposterous (laughs) I don't think it's the number of people I think it's how few people are catalyzed to do something great and and what catalyzed the greatness I mean I think we're, we're blind at the moment to our own potential because 
A lot of what happened was something I call Umwelt hacking. The Germans have a concept that the Umwelt is what you can perceive in the world. So right now we're bathed in Wi-Fi, but we need our phones to tell us what the names of the Wi-Fi networks are because we can't perceive them. They're not in our direct Umwelt. So we would call our phone a part of what Richard Dawkins called our extended phenotype, and our extended phenotype can perceive the world. Well, when you have a telescope and a microscope and an MRI and you can look inside things and make the fast slow and the slow fast so you can actually watch, you simply see a lot more. And as a result, a lot of what happened was is that people just perceived more and more of the world as it was, and that was incredibly inspiring. But I, I think that... Uh, let me just say this in terms of musicianship. I think we probably have guitarists who are as technically good as, 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 uh, as guitarists have ever been, and nobody cares. Nobody really cares about the guitar. And we have maybe one or two guitar heroes. Maybe John Mayer would be the only one. I just saw John Mayer in concert. He's completely uninterested in his own virtuosity. And I know, you know, there are other virtuoso guitarist, one in particular named Blake Mills, who seems not to care at all of that many people consider him one of the greatest guitarists living. Why is that? Because the meaning complex surrounding virtuosity and versus many of these sorts of abilities to, to perfect has evaporated. It doesn't mean as much when somebody squeezes or bends a note as it once did. And what is being said is not is not hitting home. So when, when processed client side, we find it vapid and devoid of meaning. And even the artist is almost apologetic. Yeah, I think that this is a, has been a terrible time for that. And, you know, both of these last two things we discussed where you spoke about how in the 60s, mm. there seemed to be much more of a sense of possibility and futuristic sort of um, a futuristic vision than there is today. And equally, you point out about how the bending of a note no longer means so much because so many notes are being bent. And is there then a sense of is jadedness a problem there that we are so saturated with all of these things, whether it is technology, whether it is, I mean, technology doing miraculous things, which when I was young to be doing any of the things that I did today, like using GPS to come here or recording today like this, or even being in touch with, you know, someone who's a continent away and we can meet and we can talk would have seemed absolutely freaking magical. But we just take it for granted, you know, uh, today. So is it, is it, is that also a case that this saturation is an issue in the sense that, like I think about form a lot and I think about the form of how I spent my days in the 80s where I did not have an internet or a smartphone to look at all the time. If I was bored, if I was lucky enough to have access to a book, I'd pick up the book and read it and I'd read any book I could get my hands on or I'm staring out of the window. I spoke to this great writer, Sarah Rai, who's perhaps a little older than you, an uh, incredible Hindi writer and uh, and she had such sharp observations of her childhood of what the garden was like and what everything smelled like and the colors and everything. And I said, like, how do you remember, you know, so much? And she said, Amit, we had nothing else to do. You know, it was boredom that made us notice all of these things. And I worry that in the modern age, the form of us spending our time is scrolling or right. swiping left and right. And does that sort of affect the way the brain also functions? And does it also affect the capacity of the brain to perceive magic, to feel that wonder, to feel that awe. It's an interesting point. And I find myself, every time you ask these questions, I, I could answer them in the American idiom, but I'm sort of more curious to use the local idiom. The, the first thing I would say is, is that almost certainly the phone is having an effect on the quality and nature of the brain that generates the mind that we didn't anticipate. In other words, I believe that we've restructured our brains because the screen is so powerful that somebody could be scrolling on their phone while driving, not realizing that they're operating a death trap and saying, oh my gosh, that's the cutest cat video I can imagine. So I think that our minds have actually been seriously injured by our phones. And to call them phones is also bizarre. I mean, it's some sort of god tablet that uh, allows us to implant memories from other people that never happened to us so i have a fairly clear idea what it's like to bungee jump even though i've never bungee jumped or to 
uh, dive with sharks or wh whatever it is. I've had all sorts of experiences that aren't mine and they, and I'm bored instantly. I mean, after diving with sharks, bungee jumping, I'm suddenly in a dance number and then I'm kite surfing, you know? And, and it, so you're having all of these experiences that aren't yours and your brain is being restructured and you find that your attention span has now become a barbell. You either can barely make it through a tweet or you want to watch something with the most complicated character development ever put in a visual medium like Game of Thrones or The Sopranos or any one of these Mad Men. So I think we've become something else that we weren't. And I believe that the, the issue of boredom and the issue of, of, of creativity under constraint you know, I was talking about this actually with my father-in-law where his point was because of the prohibition on kissing in Indian cinema that many of the scenes were impossibly erotic because kissing was barred, right? And I, I think it was Esther Perel, the sort of Belgian-American um, relationship and, and, and sexuality therapist who, who, who commented that Desire, desire is the product of attraction plus an obstacle. And by decreasing the obstacles, uh, we have changed the nature of what it means to be human. There's a fascinating poem called Desire by Clementine von Radix, which speaks to justice, so I'll read it out. The poem is called Desire. God, I want you in some primal wild way animals want each other, untamed and full of teeth. God, I want you in some chaste Victorian way. A glimpse of your ankle just kills me. Mm. And that speaks to exactly what you were talking about, right? That that constraint, that bring, an ankle can drive you nuts. Bring back the frickin' ankle. <laughs> bring back no, the no, no, no. Seriously, man. I, I don't, I'm not kidding around. Uh, that ship has sailed though, hasn't it? Well, then let's get it back. I don't believe in that. Especially now with AI... You can really conjure up any, and with consumer-grade AI, not even, you can conjure up any scenario with deep fakes starring whoever the hell you want and just put it out there and it's out there on the screen. I, I really what disagree do do with, with this. Ankle? I'm sorry. I, I think those of us who quest are not seeking a particular visual confirmation. We are seeking an arbiter of worth. And what the AI cannot do now is dole out dopamine based upon its judgment of whether or not we are worthy of a dopamine hit. So I go back a lot to this idea of courtly love, um, which was effectively unconsummated romance, which the well-turned ankle is even perhaps too explicit. I, I believe we have the, the capacity to wean ourselves away from this. The problem is, is that we don't find anything that is discriminating about whether we do a great job or a poor job. And as a result, in particular, men are not feeling masculine because there is nothing that actually discriminates about whether a man has been worthy. I, I saw a guy from North Africa, I think, scale a building in France to save someone, you know, just like scampered up the outside of it, parkour style. And I just thought like that was the most marvelous masculine thing in the world to save a child or, you know, to save, save a woman on a balcony. Things are aflame. We want to put ourselves at risk. How many of our creators, as we call them, which I think is a, probably a term that should be banned, um, can you imagine Michelangelo as a creator in the Sistine Chapel as his content? I mean, it's, it's to rob life of its meaning. I think people are risking their lives for Instagram for a few clicks and some dopamine. And what those people want is they want a quest. They want something to give their lives meaning. They're willing to take a risk. And clicks seems a bit cheap. 
I want to double click on the word masculine. Mm. Right now we are wired in a certain way that men behave in a certain way which society then reinforces and you have these norms mm. of what a man should be like and all of that. And part of it is understandable we've evolved that way in prehistoric times but that is descriptive and not prescriptive. We don't have to turn the is into an ought. And the danger in modern times for a lot of people is that men can be trapped by these notions of masculinity. Mm. And it isn't always a problem if you give up those notions of masculinity and you want to kind of live another way and you say fine i'm like i'm wired this way but i don't need to behave this way so what it- so my my question really is in what is your understanding of masculine and in a normative sense what are you saying that do we need a certain kind of masculinity is it oh i see that that question usually presents as a trap even though you don't intend it as I such. Don't intend no, no, I understand, but it, it does present as a trap. Because in some sense, to name the masculine and to name the feminine is to rob them in some sense of their mystery and their relationship to each other. One doesn't make sense in the absence of the other. I think part of it derives from that which we have not been able to to route around, for example. So how much of our courtship behavior has to do with a woman in her seventh to ninth month of pregnancy shortly thereafter being significantly incapacitated so as to need to depend on another. I think that the whole business about who picks up the check is not a a question of uh, an arbitrary standard. It has to do with, if I couldn't take care of myself, would you be there to do it? Do you have the wherewithal? Um, I I think that we are the most case-selected of species in that we have a tremendous investment per child that we have to deal with because of the fact that our brains are plastic and don't contain the basic programming. So I think effectively it has to do with codependence and codependence is a positive rather than a negative, which is quite disturbing. We've, We've pathologized the idea that both man and woman are incomplete without the other in a pair-bonded, child-raising context. And now um, we have an idea that, well, perhaps men will be able to have uteruses implanted and maybe we all have artificial wombs and women may be just as good or if not better at earning a living. Okay, so you'll you'll create a, a series of conditions that will rob the masculine and the feminine of their purpose, which is the child. And I think really, you know, societies that work, work backwards from babies. And societies that don't work, uh, work forwards from pleasure. In other words, pleasure has to be put in the service of the baby. So when I think of sort of the Enlightenment Project and when I think of culture in general, Mm. I see there being a tussle between sort of two impulses. And one is the impulse for culture to reinforce our programming and of course many aspects of our programming are contradictory and so on but culture reinforcing our programming in the same way that you know as paying the check being an example of that for example but at the same time it can also act to mitigate our programming to sort of mitigate uh, to paraphrase Steven Pinker badly the worst uh, demons of our nature and and that to me also seems like a useful exercise so are you saying that at some point you have to draw a line that we can tamper with human nature up to a certain point or we can mitigate human nature up to a certain point. But if you try beyond a point, then we are going to run into trouble, is that? Well, I think that what you're bringing out is that whatever it is that our original programming was intended to do is not necessarily the best, right? So this is the so-called naturalistic fallacy that the world around us is uh, soaked in blood and is largely about murder. So I don't want to <laughs> claim that whatever it is that existed in a state of nature before human nature was privileged. But I think what it is, is it's a series of load-bearing structures. And if you take one out, you have to replace it with something that is a better load-bearing structure. The, the current vogue for... I don't know how to describe it exactly. Knocking out load-bearing structures that you've decided are immoral without replacing them, without without taking the burden upon yourself to make sure that you have a better structure that is put in place before removing the old is really the problem. The problem isn't progressing things. Many things have gotten much better. 
But I think what I see now is a mania for change without checking whether or not the load-bearing nature of the previous structure has been replaced before the demolition. Can you give me an example of load-bearing structures from the past? I mean, uh, without you know necessarily talking about the ideological excesses of sure. the modern time, but just from the past to get a sense of what do you mean by load-bearing structures? You know, I forget which French philosopher, I should know this because one of my favorite quotes was a quote that actually really liberated me. It says, a nation is defined to be a group of people who have agreed to forget something in common. Wow. Yeah. And it solved a lot of problems for me because I had always assumed that people were forgetting things about our true nature and that if I could only remind them of them, we would become better people. Like, you know, the U.S. Uh, adventure in slavery or the uh, Indian adventure in caste, whatever you want to put in that place. Now, I don't have any love for the fact that our founding documents in the U.S. said that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. My feeling about that is that that was a fiction. You had slavery while that was being written. But it was a load-bearing fiction to knock that out. You know, the, the, this, uh, this woman, uh, what's her name? Nicole Hannah Jones, who had this uh, 1619 project. She just n tried to knock out the founding fiction of the country without putting in place a better fiction because it has to be a fiction. There has to be in some sense, a denial of reality. And I just find that incredibly destructive or, you know, if you're not very careful with atheism, it's one thing to, to remove a claim that one knows the mind of God. It's another thing to offer nothing in return, to, to, to not offer a vision of how to organize our morality, to how, how to stop the infinite chain of whys from resulting in relativism that leaves a, an ungovernable planet. I think you can arrive at morality through reason, and I think that infinite chain of whys would also exist uh, for a religious person. I mean, it. it are you? Are you? What's your relationship with? Uh, well, I, I'm a, I'm I'm an atheist who prays. Uh, I don't think. It's as easy to do as we all sort of intuit. We all think, well, I, I'm an, if I choose atheism, I can choose also to be moral, and you can. But I think about my friend Sam Harris, and I think Sam is a pretty moral person. What I don't think is is that there is a need to be moral once you, once you decide that there's no one here and it's a question of human flourishing. Who's to say what human flourishing is? Does, does Hannibal Lecter get a vote as to what human f flourishing actually means? Maybe human flourishing is uh, someone else's pancreas with a fine Chianti. Which is a, a fine image, but, you know, <laughs> as far as choosing... I didn't visualize it. I mean, as far as, you know, as far as choosing atheism is concerned, I don't think you choose it. I mean, people often have this mistaken uh, concept and I'm just saying this for my listeners benefit not, yeah. not not for yours but people often have this mistaken notion that atheism is believing that there is no God and actually atheism is an absence of belief it is no more a belief than not collecting stamps is a hobby as the saying goes so yeah. I, I you know if you don't believe in something that there's no evidence for it's not something you choose it just is what it is tomorrow if you were to prove God to me I'd believe that there was a God and as far as morality is concerned I think that you know, what religion has really done is provided a code for existing social norms, which were often reinforcing uh, our programming to begin with. So, you, you know, in that sense, there's a lot of rationalization going on there as well. I've been through that. And then I ended up somewhere else. That was not my final. Where did I, you end up? Babe? I ended up believing that it's a lot harder to get rid of religion. And I don't really just mean belief in God. I really mean religion. No, I mean, I agree with you in the sense that I understand that it fills a lot of holes. And what do you do with those holes? I'm worried that it's much more load-bearing than that. In other words, for the moment, let's disentangle the fitness question from the truth question. Assume that there is no God, but to really understand that there is no God is to lose fitness. That is a possibility that every atheist has to consider. 
And to lose fitness in what sense? Well, let's imagine that you had a religion that told you which side of the road was the correct road to drive on. Maybe it's the correct side to drive on. If you could sign people up to that religion, you could have a society. What happens when everyone has a very strong sense that whatever side of the road they grew up learning to drive on is the correct side? So my wife and I would be at cross purposes. Um, I drive on the right, she drives on the left, and we have no ability to work this out. It's much more important than in some sense we are synced up. And so there's certain ways in which religion... Uh, I believe that there's a Chomsky and pre-grammar of religion in the mind. And I also believe that there's a Chomsky and pre-grammar of language. Uh, so I can't be an a linguist uh, because I think the idea is that that's a, a receptor, if you will, that must be bound. It's not the case that I can say that my language is the best, but there are certain sorts of, you know, I mean, let's see, Hindi would be a, subject object verb language like Turkish, even though Turkic and, and Indic languages don't share any ostensible root, you don't find a lot of object verb subject languages. We don't know why. So the world's religions seem very varied, but I don't think you find the full panoply of possible religions. And in a certain sense, most of them have to deal with certain basic issues, the table manners, if you will. And then they usually have a foreign relations department, which is what do I do when I'm confronted with somebody who has an alternate belief system? Now, that's chaotic. It's not always desirable. But on the other hand, I'm worried that if you try to leave that receptor, if you will, unbound, it doesn't result in reason and morality the way many of us wish it would. I mean, we want it to, and it doesn't seem a priori like there's a problem. But I believe that in some sense, the reason we have the religions we do is that those who tried to leave that receptor unbound to claim that it's just like not collecting stamps found out that it's not a philately. It's, uh, it's something else. Uh, Steven Landsberg had this book called Big Questions where he argued, if I remember correctly, something to the, the effect of... Hmm? The Economist. Yeah, The Economist. Yeah. A book called Big Questions. Where, but this was more of a, this was actually an economic musing as well, where I think, uh, and forgive me if I paraphrase him wrongly, but the sense of what he was getting at, uh, which I found profound to think about, was that if you look at the revealed preferences of a lot of people who claim to believe, they don't really believe, right? And yeah. that, and converse. Sh sure, yeah. And I, mean, I believe a lot of us who claim not to believe exhibit belief huh because we fill that gap in other ways perhaps we choose other delusions and well i think it's hard not to yeah well anyway i, I didn't mean to interrupt your train yeah yeah uh, but so the question i was sort of what was the question i was getting at yeah so the question i was getting at is that if we are for a moment to accept that that is true, that a lot of uh, religiosity is, is is for show or it's just to fit in or it's, it's not really deep right. and sincere. In that case, a lot of people live by a code that appears to be a moral code without having religion as a bulwark of that. Yeah. You know, we behave in a certain way in society because part of it is mimetic. People around us do that. We see the norms and the conventions. Wait, did you we mean mimetic or mimetic? I'm sorry, uh, I meant mimetic, sorry. Oh, in a, in a Girardian sense. In a Girardian sense, okay. yeah. I mean, you know, you look at other people who behave yeah, in yeah, yeah. and, and you kind of do that, yeah. Sorry, I am Bengali, so my pronunciations it's are bad. It's not that, it's, we all I, struggle with that exact word. And before we had a conversation in which we later found out that we were saying different things, I thought I would nip that in the bud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Though to a certain extent, uh, you know, one could use both uh, mimetic and mimetic in, in, in this context, I'm I with guess. You. Yeah. We need new language, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but anyway, moving on from there, there's something else that also intrigues me, which is like I realize we contain multitudes so we can look, each, look at each other in different ways and we wear different hats at different points in time. Now, 
earlier when we were discussing the concept of home and you yeah. spoke about being in Kiev and feeling at home you spoke about coming to Bombay and feeling a connection with people here you know that moment of connection with the harmonica player in Paris and all of that is happening and and there is a sense that you are not contained here by geography that, that there's a lot more that connects you at the same time you know sometimes when you speak about say the US and China you're putting on a different hat where you're putting on the national interest hat sure and you're saying that yeah that there are directors of companies who've told you that their fiduciary duty to their shareholders is to ship the job overseas even though they know it's bad for the country mm. and you made that argument from the country point of view that this is not good for the US therefore we shouldn't do it at another level you make arguments from the species point of view putting mm. the human hat on saying yeah. that hey AI you know we need to look at the dangers we need to look at what it can do to the species Absolutely. and so on and so forth so i want to understand this a little better because you know i find it and no doubt my fellow countrymen will call me a little anti national for this but i find it hard in particular to use that nation state hat where like i completely understand that if i was a foreign policy person if i yeah. was working for the government that would be my focus but as an individual yeah. in society i'm a part of so many different diverse networks in fact one could argue that in this century just as strong men are rising up within nation states nation states themselves despite all their powers of surveillance and all that are perhaps getting less and less relevant in many domains of in the lives of individuals yeah. how does how do how does one navigate this because if you for example look at something like just outsourcing you could just shift the hat and come to a completely different conclusion well uh, but it's the question of the multiplicity of, of of selves i mean for example uh, i'm the one i think who coined the phrase xenophilic restrictionist uh, well people are very confused that i want fewer immigrants to the U united states and yet i seem to be obsessed with foreign cultures languages foods national identities because they have some kind of crazy idea that if you appreciate th those things and if you're drawn to them you should want as many people abroad to come to your country and it's completely nonsensical clearly it's a nonsensical thing but i think what people don't like is they don't like the image you know very often somebody will say to me uh you know hey i'm an h1b so of course you hate me I said, no, I've, I've actually tried to write letters on behalf of many people to sponsor them. Said, but you're a restrictionist. I'm like, yes, I want to be frustrated in my desire. I want to adopt all the puppies in the world. But I know that that would not be a good thing if I took all the puppies in the world and I raised them myself. Likewise, I don't want all of the foreign cultures to mix together in my country so that my country suddenly swells with with everyone on earth and all of these cultures become uh, de-individuated. I really, I really appreciate the Turkish language and Turkish food and Turkish culture, Turkish art music. And the same way I really appreciate Hindustani classical music as I appreciate Western classical music. And to a limited extent, I appreciate, you know, the... Uh, Tabla beat science or, you know, uh, Yehudi Menuhin and Ravi Shankar trying to get together. But I didn't actually think that that was a, such a successful meeting of the minds. I mean, sometimes you get something truly remarkable, but oftentimes if you just pour all the colors in your paint set into one bucket, you don't end up with rainbow paint. You end up with something that's kind of homogenous and not that very interesting. So I think we have to just understand that we're divided against ourselves and that dialectics are everywhere and that most of us are not good at acknowledging them. So either we penalize ourselves for hypocrisies or we uh, go all in and have a simplified position that po can't possibly carry the day. And I think that that's, that's sort of the state of affairs is that I, I, I believe that there's tension within the self and that, that those tensions are to be cherished and recognized and accepted and that we should not push everything towards artificial synthesis or saying, well, you know, is it thesis or antithesis? Pick a side. I think that's just, it's to cheat yourself of the, the purpose and the meaning of a human life. So very often what I want is at odds with itself. Just to, you know, double click on that 
phrase you used about the de individuation of cultures and how you don't want um, sort of and and i i couldn't make out there whether you're making the argument against immigration from the point of view of the nation state or from the point of view of cultures itself like do you think there is a danger that cultures can get homogenized yeah. uh, if they are in too big a melting pot is, is that sort of the worry sometimes the sometimes the homogenization is fantastic sometimes it's terrible sometimes well take a stupid example hindi and urdu are clearly two very related languages but the word choice often really matters uh, you know so I, i i keep the example of do you say kitab or do you say pustak um by the way forgive all mispronunciations be- yeah, i didn't yeah. grow up with your phonemes I, but I i pronounce as, I, i mispronounce as many of these uh, words as you do so you're too good. kind and, and 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 perhaps you could stand for a little bit more honesty i think that sometimes the shadings really you know they they really matter and i like to have access to them all if i can but but i'm also aware that we have to maintain somebody has to maintain these original sort of source cultures and then the combinations you know are are, are almost always the <laughs> the most beautiful things but it's tough it's tough to to discriminate when is the combination really working and when is it some forced thing that really ends up being an abomination you know in a sense you know hindi urdu is a great example actually for me to sort of push back a little because it's an example of what happens where of forced divisiveness like the politics behind this right. is hindi and urdu in a sense were this were the same language at one point you could call it hindustani it was a delightful mixture of influences from prakrit and sanskrit and arabic and persian and all of right. that and it was this beautiful rich language and then with the hindu muslim politics of the late 19th century you had a political project to build hindi as something separate from urdu and that also led especially as partition came and independence came but through those decades it led to a point where there was something called shuddh hindi or right. pure hindi which was almost an artificial creation and people didn't really speak like that it wasn't spontaneous order that brought it about it was sort of it was almost a political movement that we will use separate words we won't use their words you know right. there there words you know urdu being associated sure. with muslimness in pakistan and all of that and the two words you gave in fact pustak and kitab you know yeah. pustak is a very artificial word i don't think in everyday speak anybody says you know like if they say pass me the book they won't say your pustak de do that will be very weird they'll write it in their exam right. but they'll say yaar wo kitab de you know yeah. uh, so it's actually an example of how it's gone the other way and if you look at the spontaneous order what that was leading to was this common language which has influences from everywhere yeah but we have different artificial lang- language projects right i mean esperanto is the most famous of them but for example the the emergence of modern turkish from what was previously osmanlıca or ottoman you know this was a a political reform of ataturk where he actually had s- was in the unique position of being able to change the very orthography of the language from arabic script to a roman alphabet modified roman alphabet um and the language was regularized so you, you know that the, the hybrids were sort of purged now the french do this they have a national sort of language police if you will and then there was the emergence of modern hebrew which nobody had really spoken hebrew as an everyday language in thousands of years I think we we don't really appreciate the importance of the artificial. If you create an artificial lake in Central Park, the birds don't know that it's artificial. They stop there. If you sink a container by the shore, the corals don't know, and they'll create a reef out of it. The yearning for an identity is is sometimes artificial, but it ends up being natural. and it depends you know sometimes you have an an unworkable yearning and so a word doesn't take i was i i've been really fascinated by the number of places where bombay uh remains and the other places where mumbai has taken over i've watched that in my lifetime but i've never heard anyone sing mumbai merry hey right i mean the 
That's because you come here and stay in South Bombay. I think <laughs> if you come to the suburbs, everyone will say Mumbai. No, no, I mean, but, but, but I, I, I don't saying, have a horse in this I'm race. That but the song. Yeah. Yeah, is yeah. not mum 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 by Mary Hay. Huh, but I mean that's a fixed thing in time. But that's, that's what I'm trying to say, hmm. right? Which is, if I say feeling groovy, because the 59th Street Bridge song retained it. it it's interesting to me that 20th Century Fox by the Doors and Foxy Lady of Jimi Hendrix have taken the slang word from my childhood for an attractive young woman. And made it relatively archival and permanent. What did Foxy mean when you were a child? Oh, that woman was a fox. Meant she was a very appealing and sexually attractive young woman. You know, th there was another song that has fallen into disrepair called "Fox on the Run." But you know, my my father still uses the phrase "Oh, she's a tomato." For, <laughs> for the same, the same uh, designation. So I think that, you know, very often what happens is that great art takes the ephemera of a time and makes it permanent. Um, so, yeah, the, these things, they, they rise, they fall, they come back. If, 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 if anybody had said that Hebrew would come back into daily usage, it wouldn't have been anyone to take that bet. Which is why I'm kind of in favor of just letting everything mingle and letting societies and cultures mingle and, you know. I Sorry, mean, but the, the national aspiration is one of those things that just is allowed to mingle. The desire to express oneself, the desire to, to revitalize something which has become defunct is one of those things. I, I have mixed feelings about these things. I have, I have a feeling about the danger of uh, revitalizing things but that can go horribly wrong and the danger of denying them when people have a yearning to return to something. And so I, I think that most of the people that I know don't really think about the fact that the artificial is in a certain deeper sense natural. And I think... A lot of this in modern times, like, you know, reviving something or not reviving something. Right. Back in the day, it would depend perhaps on the patronage of princes or kings or maybe what the state does and so on and so yeah. forth. And in modern times, I think individuals are far more empowered to revive whatever the hell they want to revive and to, you know, so it's... We don't know. I, you see, so much of our lives were determined by events in the 1940s. And that, those events have become distant. And if I talk to you about the American experience of the GIs returning or the atomic weapons um, that were developed, and you might talk to me about freedom at midnight, you know, so the birth of the, of the modern version of the state, those visions are decaying everywhere in the world. They've got, they had a very powerful effect. They stabilized the planet. And we're actually headed into a situation in which we've lost our fear of the early 20th century. And the early 20th century was so powerful and so potent that we devitalized in large measure because it wasn't safe to remain vital. The toys, the power became so overwhelming as to become existential in its scope. You know, I was just, uh, I had a really interesting experience visiting the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in, in uh, Navy Nagar. And I went to a very abstract talk about gravitational waves and dark matter. And in order to attend the talk, I had to go through a military checkpoint. Now, the odd thing have you spent much time at TIFR? I haven't been there. It is the nicest place in the city. It's just magical. I, I, I love it. The grounds are immaculate. The art is everywhere. The buildings speak to trying to make your scientists as comfortable as they can be. And the Indian minds that populate this place are dealing in incredible abstraction, which is in some sense government-funded in a relatively poor country. Now, what is going on with that? It took me a while to figure it out. It's the ethos of the 1950s living undisturbed 
in Maharashtra. And, and, and that's what's amazing. Like the U.S. is no longer catering to its scientists this way. F they figure, well, we've already got a hydrogen bomb. Why are we keeping these clowns fed and happy? In India doesn't have that feeling at all. It's like, we, we never know when we're going to need this brain power, man. So in a certain way, I just visited 1952. And people don't also appreciate that in, the, in a certain sense, you could argue that this is the modern birthplace of what is called quantum gravity, which has led to a 70-year stagnation at the forefront of questioning the cosmos. When a, a husband-wife team named Bryce and Cecile DeWitt came to Bombay and had their first child here, I believe, and began this study of quantum gravity here uh, at the very foundation of, of TIFR. So I think if I hadn't visited this place, and I've been here before, but I wouldn't know what the 1950s were like. I'll send you a link to an episode I did with the brilliant uh, science historian John V. Falke. She wrote the superb book called Atomic State, which is about that period of time where TIFR was formed, in fact, yeah. so the years before that. And she speaks about 1932 as this time of great possibility, the Annus Mirabilis of, uh, you know, a certain 1932. Kind of, yeah, as uh, Annus Mirabilis of, I think, either nuclear physics or theoretical physics. It's the discovery of the neutron. Right. Yeah. So, so this is the this is the actual year that the doom the the doom of humanity on Earth is sealed. No, no, I'm not kidding. Right. Yeah. One discovery. I mean, our doom is sealed anyway, right? No. I mean, the law of truly large numbers means we can't really be around forever. I mean, one way or the other, we are going to Sorry, uh, pop it. I disagree. We have one hope, which is. I'm the only person saying this this way, so I'm going to repeat myself, but I'm. It's, a, it's basically a two-line proof. It's totally clear why I'm the only person saying it. I have no idea. But it, it's very uncomfortable. The solar system is an escape room. And there's a ticking time bomb that started in 1932. And nobody is working to escape the escape room. And I cannot figure out what, what we are doing. I'm not questioning that it's a ticking time bomb. I'm questioning that no, no, it is the ticking time bomb which will take us down. Well... You only need one to prove that you're in an escape room and to find no one working on escape. I mean, Elon Musk is the closest. He's talking about Mars, which is still inside the solar system and the moon. So he's accepted. He's decided it's an escape house and we should move to another room. And my claim is... It, you know, the, there's a phrase that came into my mind. I have no idea where it came from. I figured it must be in currency somewhere. I can't find it on the internet. And the phrase is, our, uh, our home is in the stars or not at all. And that is, I'm convinced that the earth is our womb, not our home. And we have not understood this. So we're fighting to stay in our womb and the contractions are starting to come minutes apart. And it's doubling our efforts to, to remain here. And I don't know why we're doing that. And, and one, of the, one of the things that I wish is I wish India would go non-correlated. I wish it would stop sucking up to the West and stop looking to the West for approval and lead. And I wish that the U.S. would lead. I mean, I don't, I'm a proud American. I'm not an Indian. But... Somebody has to decorrelate from this, this state of acceptance, the state of learned helplessness. And if I could pick a place, I'd probably choose TIFR. So, you know, something that strikes me and carrying on from what we what you mentioned earlier about the 1940s how we are still stuck in those frames yeah and you know in india as well we are we are sort of stuck in a mindset that we adopted at that time still traumatized by partition etc cetera, etc cetera. a lot of shit going on and i wonder if that process of being stuck in an old way of thinking yeah. and an old way of looking at the world based on what the world might have been then right is both number one a failure of imagination and number two uh, a surrender to inertia 
and if both of those then play into exactly what you're talking about here like here what you're saying is you you're saying that our frame of thinking of the earth as our home is wrong completely our wrong. frame has to be of thinking of it as an escape pod or whatever and my instinctive reaction which i try to fight whenever i hear something new my instinctive reaction is to recoil and say hey, what are you talking about but i try to fight that because i find that we need to fight that we need to reconsider every frame right right so tell me a little bit more before we go into a break tell me a little bit more about how you arrived at uh, you know this particular frame because just the task of saying that a home will be in the stars seems so incredibly outlandish where even that relatively modest move that Elon Musk is talking about going to Mars often seems like something we you know won't see in our lifetime yeah i think elon is talking about something harder than what i'm talking about oh really okay yeah yeah, yeah. so for example if you said well i studied economics be- you, you might say, a person might say i studied economics because physics seemed too hard The physicist's rejoinder is always what are you talking about? Economics is so much harder than physics. None of us would even dream of of studying economics because it's, un, in, it's insoluble. I think founding of alternate civilizations using chemical rockets is impossible. I think that the hope of escape is based on physics that we know not. And therefore it's just a question of discovery. So I think what Elon is trying to do is the really heavy lift. What I'm trying to do is the Hail Mary pass as we call it in the US, a desperate attempt to say the theory beyond Einstein might contain all sorts of new possibilities. So I think that we just have the entire thing completely misframed. But Elon is laying out a concrete path. You okay. know, while I, I uh, so forgive me if I misunderstood or maybe you can make it more concrete or for me. Or let's have a fight. No no I don't want to fight. I I want to understand I'm I'm never into fighting no, no, I, no, I just no, want to no, I just mean an intellectual fight I, Yeah yeah no even then I mean so make it concrete for me in the sense that when you say a home is in the stars we need to escape and so on and so forth help me imagine that well, what do you mean what if I had said to you let's imagine we we're talking in the 1600s and I say uh, Amit, I I look up every day at the sun as it rises in the east and I dream about the power of the sun not in some remote place but brought here on the surface of the earth promethean fire if you will it would sound mad but it really just had to do in some sense with the neutron right which is discovered in 1932 as per your earlier point and the neutron allowed us to bring the sun to the surface of the earth hasn't the sun always been on the surface of the earth in the sense that it powers our forests and our trees and every and life on no, earth itself no i would say that those are the, the that is the photon that is produced as radiation from the sun i'm talking about the fusion of nuclei nuclei don't 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 fuse uh on the surface of the earth until individuals teller ulam uh Lee Smitner Zillard Chadwick Rutherford I means that there's sort of a chain Fermi beta all of these folks figured out how the sun is powered in some sense and you know Chandra Shekhar the and how how to make this happen on earth and we did it in 19 in I think November of 1952 so you know you, you want to pick a date for BC versus AD probably should be an explosion known as IV Mike in the Pacific Ocean in 1952 which was when TIFR was founded that moment was the moment that promethean fire in the in the form of nuclear fusion occurred on earth so what i'm talking about is something like that you you solve some equations somewhere and suddenly you can do something that you were never able to do before uh like why why wasn't there radio in the 1700s you you just need to understand something about the world and elon is trying to do this without understanding something i can't i can't understand elon how would you try to become an interplanetary civilization when it's this hard of a lift using liquid rocket fuel but isn't sort of the future technology you're thinking of in the space of unknown unknowns like today you can look back with hindsight and you can say yeah you know we did 1952 whatever happened yeah. we did this we did that but 
before it happened it was unknown unknowns are, are, are we relying on some kind of faith in our ingenuity to actually find that path forward is is that well, sure there's a certain amount of faith but we actually know that almost to a certainty that einstein can't be the last word we know that his equations break down in two places one at the sort of beginning of time if you will which we uh, sort of reference in the Big Bang, and the other is at the center of a black hole, which we call the Schwarzschild singularity. And effectively, uh, when you get a singularity in the in the solutions to the equations, the most likely explanation for that is that you didn't exactly have the right equations, and you were able to fake it up until the point when uh, when you got down to zero size. So at the beginning of time or at the center of uh, spatial collapse, the equations break down. And so that says, oh, there's a theory beyond. And to not seek that theory beyond with full vim and vigor is, is to capitulate. Is You know, this is a poignant Indian story. We had a family friend, let's call her Auntie Janaki, and... She was getting up there in years, and we went to go visit her. She was there with her sister who'd come from Switzerland. And she said, you know, my body was failing, and I realized that we all have a finite amount of time, and I had led a good life, and the earth and I had finished our conversation, and I was preparing myself, and I was accepting this and that and the other thing, and I was being called home and all this stuff. And then her sister turned to us and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. What she needed was blood plasma. <laughs> <laughs> so I got her the blood plasma. Now she's fine. But I love the phrase, conversation with the earth. <laughs> well, I, would, yeah. I, I, I don't know that she said that. I'm just making stuff up in the idiom. Right? Well, well done then. <laughs> yeah. So the key point being that we can poetically resign ourselves to our fate. Or we can get the hell out of here and recognize that maybe our fate is to think this thing through. We started this clock. We led ourselves into the valley of death. And what right now what we need is people to lead us the hell out of here. And, you know, one of the things that I found very moving about the story of the founding of TIFR was the fact that this was a conversation between Tata and Bobby and, and, and Baba. And, and uh, Homie Baba wrote to Tata and said, we need to do something. He said, done. You know, I, I was struck recently that the world's top 10 individuals in terms of wealth had two names that ended in Ani, and there's no sense of that community outside of India. I don't think most Americans even know that that community exists. It is time to leave. It is time to save us all. And the right way to do that is through physics. And the reason that it's, it's sort of an inexorable conclusion is, is that I, I think nuclear fusion is probably the highest leverage technology. You've had COVID? Yeah, I've had COVID. Yeah, so have I. And I knew that you had, even though we've never discussed it, because it got into all of our lungs. Most probably that came out of a lab. And we're feverishly denying that that's true in the U.S., to, to, we, we, we treat everybody who, who suggests that as if they are a lunatic. Um, That's changing now, I think, a little bit, you know, and even those who denied it earlier are kind of gaslighting us and saying, hey, we didn't really deny it like that. Then let's get rid of these people. We don't need to talk to them again. Anybody yeah. who gaslights an entire planet when all of us become infected with their mistaken handiwork, I don't understand why these people are in power and they need to leave, period, the end. There is no more. I have no patience for this. You cannot gaslight an entire pe planet worth of people whose lives you shortened, whose IQs you lowered, whose children are, are, are worse off. I mean, this is an abomination, whatever it is. And whether it's China or the U.S., I don't care. But these people who gaslit us and told us it is racism to ask this question, uh, they need to go into retirement instantly. That said, that shows you the leverage the technology has right? People worry about the ICBM-like delivery of a thermonuclear weapon, but I worry that one day Tulsa, Oklahoma will simply cease to exist because the weapon will already be inside the United States. We've never seen 
a hydrogen bomb used against a civilian population, even if we've seen nuclear weapons used on two separate occasions. We are not prepared for who we are or what, what is about to happen. And the fact that the cost of this will go down and more nations will be able to do this and soon maybe an individual will have her or his own H-bomb. This has been the period of quiet that precedes what is about to come. And I don't know whether that's two days away or 200 years away. It certainly felt like it might be a lot farther away. I don't think it's that far away anymore. Whatever that thing is, it's about to happen because the cost of these high, highly leveraged platforms, whether it's bioweaponry or nuclear weaponry or even digital weaponry, is go these things are going to spread. And as they spread, more bad actors, more irresponsible actors will have these things at their disposal. So right now we're waiting with what mathematicians would call a Poisson process. These things will arrive. And the key point is that we all share an atmosphere. The earth may be divvied up in terms of its land into different nation states. But to your point that you don't find nation states that powerful, the key thing that we share that we can't stop sharing is an atmosphere. And the atmosphere will carry radiation, it'll carry pathogens, and it will carry the costs of uh, human-mediated climate change. And all three of those things are potentially existential. We need to diversify the number of atmospheres that humans have access to because you can't afford to have all of this under one. Why is it, you and I have never met before until today, why is it that we've both had the same disease? You know, there's an island in the South Atlantic that I love called St. Helena. And I think St. Helena was COVID free because they had draconian uh, quarantine and they were so isolated that they just didn't have it. It was a pathetic example of what is necessary to have COVID diversity. And then eventually they had to capitulate because they need people to be able to move around. So they accepted that COVID was going to come to their shores. Right now, the most important thing is to increase the number of atmospheres that humans have access to, to some very large number. Most people accept that there's one, the earth. Elon thinks there should be three, maybe because you can create an atmosphere on the moon and on Mars. And I think that that's so hard to do with chemical rockets, it's almost not worth trying. But the real opportunity is to change the laws of physics and to see whether or not the theories beyond Einstein have the possibility of easy visitation to distant realms. I'll add an advance to that and say right now the most important thing, given that it's 3.30 in the afternoon and you haven't eaten anything all day, is to feed you. So we'll take a quick commercial break. Looking take, forward to Take a bite and come thanks. back. Long before I was a podcaster, I was a writer. In fact, chances are that many of you first heard of me because of my blog India Uncut, which was active between 2003 and 2009 and became somewhat popular at the time. I love the freedom the form gave me and I feel I was shaped by it in many ways. I exercised my writing muscle every day and was forced to think about many different things because I wrote about many different things. Well, that phase in my life ended for various reasons and now it is time to revive it. Only now, I'm doing it through a newsletter. I have started the India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com where I will write regularly about whatever catches my fancy. I'll write about some of the themes I cover in this podcast and about much else. So please do head on over to indiauncut.substack.com and subscribe. It is free. Once you sign up, each new installment that I write will land up in your email inbox. You don't need to go anywhere. So subscribe now for free. The India Uncut newsletter at indiauncut.substack.com. Thank you. Welcome back to The Scene and the Unseen. I'm chatting with Eric Weinstein about his life and a lot else. And, you know, we spoke about a lot of big ideas before the break. Uh, and now I'd like to sort of know a little bit more about your life. So, like, tell me about your childhood. Where were you born? What, was your, what were your early days like? I was born in L.A. And then I ended up... I would say that the, some of the major determiners of where I ended up were my grandparents and uh, learning issues. Explain that, those. I find school almost impossible. And people have an idea that if you're smart enough, school is easy. 
it's just not true. It's like if you're good at music, you should be able to read it and never anticipating a blind musician. So I would say that probably my learning disabilities, as they were called at the time, were really central to how I became different from other people. I often feel that, you know, one of the, like there are many frames that we operate within which are artifacts of a time gone by. And I think yeah. the education system really is one of those where, you know, created really in the early 19th century, you're having kids of the same age study together for a certain set of years and you're churning out workers for the industrial revolution. And it makes absolutely no sense to me because you're asking a fish to compete with a monkey by climbing a tree. And that just doesn't make sense to me. It's interesting. Uh, I think as uh, early as the late 1800s, this was actually widely recognized. If you think about, are you familiar with the major general song from the Pirates of Penzance? No? No, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a patter song of Gilbert and Sullivan. And Gilbert writes the lyrics... I am the very model of a modern major general of information, animal and vegetable and mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo and order to categorical. And it's a story of a general who has useless information in his head. And then in the final portion of the song, he starts talking about the fact that he has no real knowledge of the military. And so it was a song about British promotion through educational attainment outside of the specific competence for which one was being trained. There's a similar song from uh, the HMS Pinafore, which I guess preceded it because the song references it and breaks the fourth wall about someone who polishes up the handle the big front door of a law office and becomes the ruler of the Queen's Navy. <laughs> and I, I think we've we've really been in, in a situation for a long time where education hasn't made sense, but it, it, it continues because it's useful for weeding people. And so while it doesn't really teach you what it claims to teach you, it doesn't prepare you for what it promised you it, it would, it does come up with an arbitrary system of tasks and see who's better at solving them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more about sorting than actually, I mean, I used to think the Indian education system is more about sorting than actually teaching something, but you're saying it's like that everywhere. Well, it depends which ed ed educational system, because India doesn't have, I mean, Nehru's emphasis on tertiary education as a means of not having to educate a large population at a primary and secondary level is an odd legacy. Yeah, indeed. Tell me about your relationship with music because you know you play a lot of it uh, in your instagram videos and you really seem happiest when you just got a guitar in your hand and you're kind of doodling you've spoken at different times with great passion about for example when you spoke about eddie van halen you've spoken about how he connected with your head your heart and your loins yeah and that just feels like a complete kind of sensory emotion or a complete kind of love which i which really very few things give very few people so Tell me about your love for music. Well, I think music is just, n none of us know why it's there. We don't know what its importance is. Uh, and as a result, the fact that it has a strongly analytic core that you don't really come in contact with unless you play it and analyze it. You don't realize the extent to which our brains respond emotionally and spiritually to algorithms. So it's a very weird way in which people don't know why a song makes them feel what it does. The musician, who does have an idea of that, first of all, doesn't have complete knowledge. They just know that certain behaviors produce sadness, happiness, et cetera. And I don't know, it's, a, it's very strange. I, I used to think that music should not be in the arts department of a university. It should be in the science department. Because there's so much that can be said, particularly harmonically or rhythmically. Uh, there's not a lot that can be said analytically about melody. We don't, in general, have a good theory of melody. We have a pretty good theory of harmony. And from an India perspective, Indian perspective, it's very strange because harmony is 
almost not existent in Indian music. And conversely, Western rhythm is pathetic and finds its highest expression in Indian music. So we have we have these two odd facts. I, I guess it has to do with the fact that do re mi is even tempered and sarega is not. So if you if you even tempered sarega, there's a question about what would have happened to Hindustani classical music, for example. We don't know. And you and, and you've spoken about like the mathematical genius of Bach, for example. Yeah. And people often talk about how, like, when I was a kid, I would hear about how three things are closely related. So if you're good at one, you're likely to be good at the others. I don't know how true that is, sure. and that's music, math, and chess. Well, math encompasses chess. I think Hardy, who brought Ramanujan famously to England, said that chess was pure mathematics, but of a sort of unappealing sort in that there were no good reasons for the axioms of how the pieces would move, but once you set the rules and play, the mathematics and combinatorics and forced decision trees constituted a form of mathematics. So let's group chess and mathematics as one. The question is, what's the relationship between people of a musical bent and people of a mathematical one? And that's less clear because in a Western context, harmony gives us an opportunity to explore that. But you see, the one portion of, of uh, mathematics that you can't deny is that a one-dimensional vibrating medium, whether it's an air column in the form of a flute or a vibrating string held fixed between two points, has a wave equation. And that wave equation has certain overtones that occur in very precise patterns. If you have a metallophone, like a two-dimensional vibrating medium, there's no guarantee that the overtones will be in pleasing combinations. That's why a steel drum from Jamaica fashioned out of an oil drum seems relatively muddy. But that is the form of mathematics that, that comes it, through almost all cultures. Most cultures will stretch a cat gut or hollow out a piece of wood to make a flute. And implicit in that decision is the construction of an overtone series. So that will be effectively, let me see, it'll be sa followed by sa an octave higher, followed by pa above that sa, followed by yet another sa, and then there's this weird ga that isn't, I guess you'd say komal uh, for soft. And it's slightly flat to what we would call me in Western music. And in fact, I believe that the, the pa or the uh, so in, in Western music is ever so slightly flat to the Pythagorean version. But it's so good when you use a 12 tone even tempered system that the ear doesn't notice the difference. And so there's a weird way in which, you know, if you, if you continue that, the, uh, the gaz followed by pa followed by a, a sort of a flat knee. I'm not, I'm not in my own idiom. So I'm just having to think this through that, that pattern is forced upon you by physics. And so the brain appears to find it pleasing because it's not a choice. One of the, I mean, I, 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 I play chess quite a bit and I was blown away when Alpha Zero first came and, 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 you know, it was just orders of magnitude ahead of Stockfish at the time those games took place. And I remember you saying somewhere that in chess today, because of AI, you can see quote unquote poetry of a higher order. And I want to lead with that to a question about what I feel is a false dichotomy people make about art and craft. Yeah. Like the way I think about it is that everything is craft, only we call it art when we can't understand the processes by which it is doing what it is doing and then we give it a mystical air. Like you correctly said, a certain 
combination of notes in a certain way can make us feel melancholy or can make us feel happy and can make us feel whatever they hit certain neurons in certain ways and we don't understand this yet so yeah. the process seems mystical to us it seems creative it seems like sure. poetry but actually there is a science here as well and everything is working to a certain order that is merely hidden from us so that difference between art and craft per se is really a difference in our understanding but they essentially the same thing and and therefore when you think of ai and machine learning and so on that you you know and, and that's why i believe that you can have what appears to be incredibly creative work in musical work and work that can uh, move us to tears or can uh, make us dance um, coming out of ai for that matter so you bring up an interesting point it is said and perhaps peter thiel was the first person to say something like this in my presence so i'm i'm not sure from whom i'm stealing but it could be peter that technology is mechanism that barely works once it works we no longer call it technology wow and in a certain sense what you're saying about art is art is craft that it barely works because once everyone knows how to do it it doesn't feel like art anymore and i think this is also what happened to to europe actually by the way is that people got so good at turn at churning out competent art that they devalued that art and so the vatican is filled with works of art that no one other than an art historian ever cares about because they were just doing so much of this and i i found this on the steps of the great art museum in vienna austria is that there were all these statues low down that you could see the detail on but they continued to hire and hire floors outside you know in the sort of front of the building and i realized nobody could see these details they weren't for anybody and why is that well they'd gotten so good at doing these these statues that you could afford to do them all up and down a building whether anyone saw them or not so i think that in a certain way we're interested in what we call art breaking new ground and as soon as it becomes something everybody can do we just sort of you know you go from saying well that's a great that's a great song that you've recorded to let's do some karaoke yeah and and let's talk about ai a bit because in one of your early episodes with lex friedman you said quote the context to our life is coming to an end stop quote and i find that really profound and i find that really true and i Wait, think i said what the context <laughs> to our life is coming to an end yeah i'm quoting you you did say that but it's it's a great uh, sentence what is what what did it mean let me turn the tables on you on it what did it mean to me what did it, what did it mean to you it meant to me that the frame in which we are living our lives yeah. is completely turned around the context has changed that ai changes everything i mean just for a creator for example like i was chatting with my writing students and they were First like first of all i want to just stop us hmm. let's not say creator okay i mean it's it's what term we use i don't know but hmm. i'm going to do it when i'm not with you Okay. <laughs> and you're going to do it when you're not with me. But for the purpose of this podcast, let's okay. value ourselves enough not to call ourselves creators. Okay, I think I dignify the term a bit more than you do, but fine. I'll I'll respect sure. your wishes here. And, and and we won't mention content either. Okay, now I'm going to have to speak really slowly because I'm going to have to put those filters on, but cool so i'll i'll uh, go with that but the reason i'm doing that is i mm. i do think that is the answer to your question is that what we're in the process of doing is devaluing our lives by changing our context by allowing these terms to seep into our speech we're spoiling everything that we do if i call you a reply guy and i call another person a pick me girl or i say that a socialist in the us is a bernie bro what i'm doing is i'm i'm turning everything into a generic and then the idea is well what kind of a a pick me girl are you what kind of a reply guy are you and i i think that that's just terrible and i think that part of what we have to do is to move away from from modern speech because it's one of these i don't know whether maybe a wittgensteinian sort of a prison of language i want art man i want everything grand feels grandiose 
isn't and i'll have to use the term because we're talking about the term isn't creator a term just like engineer that it's a broad term and it's a useful functional term and in a way it includes artists within it without the pretentiousness that comes from calling uh, someone an artist and for me therefore it's it's it it serves a purpose it's a functional term but i guess we're looking at the term differently and let's look at the term virtuoso it. that term i understand and if you say somebody is an engineer and i think more like a virtuoso that's a like physicist that guy is a theoretical physicist i don't call myself a theoretical physicist the word has grandeur built into it not grandiosity but grandeur right so in some sense the idea of a creator or influencer is cognitively I mean maybe it's correct but it's emotively shaded in a way that prejudices the context in which I I encounter that person it's it's like ruining everybody's first impression Okay I mean I kind of see it a little differently because Say more. I find that a lot of like what has happened what happened in the past yeah. is that whether you could apply a term like this to yourself right often depended on gatekeepers and access and today in a sense with the means of production open to all of us right anyone can go out there and start creating right, right? and therefore you if you need a generic term to describe them like the term engineer describes engineers what other term would there be because many of these people like i would not call myself an artist per se but i would call myself a creator if you want to get specific i'm a Why podcaster an artist, i'm an artist in other context i'm not sure this podcast is art why does anyone listen to this podcast no people listen to this podcast i know but yeah. why it's not because of art it might be because of illumination plus entertainment plus insight plus a bunch of those things so you're uncomfortable with it in some sense like when you said pretentiousness earlier um what i heard is and and I, I, i'm all about this question so i find it fascinating what you're asking you're allowed to say my expertise is within 14th century persian miniatures you're not allowed to say my genius is anything right so that there's those things which you can refer to yourself as being and there are those things that you must wait for the curator to decide yeah. apply to you if you're a painter you're allowed to call yourself an artist but what if you're a great conversationalist you seem like a pretty great conversationalist to me you know what i'm doing is i am actually not demeaning myself by saying that in the context of my podcast I'm not an artist like when I try to write or when I try to do poetry you say you're a I'm, writer I'm 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 going for art that's okay I I don't mind saying I'm going for art in those domains I'm not going for art here but in my mind there's not an hierarchy this is not lesser than that this is still valuable and I'm creating and I think and and forget about me for a moment imagine an 18 year old kid who goes out there who's trying things on youtube who's just right. turning the camera on herself and she's shooting stuff and it's too early and too presumptuous and perhaps too meaningless given how broad that term is for her to call herself an artist but where does she belong what is she doing and i think to call herself a creator kind of makes sense and uh, for me that term has dignity i mean i can understand where you're coming from sure. where you find that it, it's a devaluation yeah, of right. a certain kind but you know I, i i think i just use it differently and people i know use it a little differently yeah I, i'm trying to get at something else but mm. i no no please I've... so for example sometimes i do live performances why does anyone show up i'm not sure you know at some point i was touring with sam harris the two of us would sit on a stage and it was called adventures in conversation and people would literally listen to two guys talking and you could see people on on uh, particularly on reddit right they get really angry like i don't get it two guys talking why should we listen to them? why why don't they listen to us talking a totally reasonable question we're not comfortable with ourselves everything feels cringe and i think that there's something wrong with the medium there's something wrong with the fact that we don't have a word for grandeur we have the word grandiosity 
That's grandiose. That's narcissistic. That's incredibly cringe. What is it that we're doing to ourselves where we're not allowed to talk about genius? We're not allowed to talk about art. We have to talk about these things as, you see, if, if perfume is an art, it's a, a supreme act of confidence to call something Chanel number no. five. And, you know, there's this odd fact that Dracar Noir was the first scent not to emulate the natural world in terms of either musks, like an animal or florals or whatever, but it was like supposed to smell like industry because industry was what was happening, man. There's a weird way in which we're just uncomfortable that certain people are more interesting and certain people are trying to be interesting and they succeed 75% of the time, 25% of the time you can see that they're transparently not being interesting. And, and what we're looking for is we're looking for great conversationalists. We're looking for, for grandeur. We're looking for something to change our lives and make them more meaningful. And my feeling about this is I really value the fact that I sat down here and you didn't ask me the same set of questions everybody else does. I have no idea why everybody asks me the same questions. I don't mean everybody. I mean, obviously, I, when I go on Lex or I go on Joe Rogan, both those guys get different episodes out of me. But a lot of the time, people just want to talk about what they've, what they've seen before. It's like sort of cover songs. So anyway, I just want to leave the door open to the idea that we actually have to fight the concept of cringe, the f fight the sense of apologies. Well, of course, I can't call myself an ex. We've got to get back to the idea that glory is a great thing. I agree with you entirely on the substance of what you're saying. But as far as the language is concerned, I'm actually thinking aloud here. I'll actually come at the opposite conclusion Please. in the sense that I think art is a problematic term mm. because it because one it sort of signifies a hierarchy that something is art and something is not and as we just discussed you know the distinction between art and craft itself is false and I don't see where that should be there and secondly when you call something art and something else not art someone is doing the calling you know and typically what I have seen in the world of art, for example, is that you will have a gatekeeper culture of elites who will determine that X is art and Y is not art. And at some visceral level, yeah. I object to that. <sighs> I, I'd, I'd love everything to get out there. Yeah. I won't use the term creator economy, which is a way of using it. <laughs> but I want everything to get out there. I want everyone to have a shot without having to think about that specific label. So I'm actually comfortable with creator. I'm not so comfortable with art. See, I have a different take on this. I really do. And it has to do with the fact that I screwed this up so badly. You have no idea. <laughs> I had the idea that this gatekeeping elite was, it was so annoying. I just thought they were parasites. And the culture of the curator is actually the culture of co-creation with the artist. I don't think in some sense great art happens without an insemination where you have the art object and then you have the analyst who stands outside it and says, I actually can see a bunch of stuff that I've never seen before and I want to I want to deconstruct this and comment on this. And I think a lot about Hitchcock and the Beach Boys. I talk about this all the time with my son Zev. Hitchcock chose horror, which didn't seem to support great art. And the Beach Boys chose surfer songs. And Brian Wilson was actually sort of this musical genius who, you know, along with people like Frank Zappa, were, were trying to actually do modern classical composition inside of a pop idiom. And Hit, Hitchcock was uh, innovating all sorts of kind of artistic techniques within the horror idiom. And I, I think this sort of shows off the genius that until somebody says, don't you realize what Hitchcock did? You know, he pulled back the camera as he zoomed in to get the vertigo effect and he was innovating in this way or that or some color was subtracted from the palette. You don't get the concept of what that art is. So I think actually what we find repugnant 
is why does some person who doesn't get something get to say what is and what isn't? I, I used to like Roger Ebert, the film critic, a great deal. He screwed up two films really badly. <laughs> Which one? One was Mulholland Drive, and the other was Memento. And in both cases, he decided that the very difficult inner logic of the film was some sort of wasn't there and that all that was was a great impressionistic masterpiece and you just had to sit back and let the feel of it determine in both cases i saw people say you missed the actual you know i think with memento it was two different sequences going in opposite directions but with interdigitation so that they were interleaved one going forward one going backwards i forget what the issue was in mulholland drive um a great example of this that I talk about a lot with a single film critic was Joe Morgenstern's, who I vaguely knew, a description of Bonnie and Clyde. He saw Bonnie and Clyde and he said, this is an absolute piece of rubbish film. It's got a soundtrack by bluegrass artist Flat and Scruggs that is totally emotively out of keeping with the violence. You have incredible violence and you have an up-tempo, happy blue, uh, bluegrass soundtrack. And then two weeks later, he rewrote the review. And he said, you know that guy, Joe Morgenstern, who told you this was a lousy picture? He's an idiot. I'm Joe Morgenstern and I'll tell you how great this film is. Well, wow, right? It really, it shows what a great curator can do. Is to say, that's incredible intellectual honesty. Like, show me that today. Right. Well, actually, you know where you find it? Podcasting. Joe Rogan will say, oh, I was wrong. Lex Friedman would say, you know, yeah. uh, I've been wrong about curators. I was wrong about UFOs. There's a bunch of stuff that I just got totally wrong. I think what, what you're not seeing is you're not seeing that happen in the institutional idiom because the institutions want to keep this sort of I don't know, this godlike voice unsullied. So we'd rather you make an error and you stick with your error so that nobody actually has to realize that this is created by a process in people. You mentioned cover songs and you mentioned sort of people asking you the same questions again and again and bands hate playing their own songs, their own hits, you know, like Radiohead, Radiohead hates playing Creep. Right, that's an early song in the revolution and, you know, they've done such great music after that and why the hell do they have to play the same damn thing over and over again? And I think that can happen to everyone. And I wonder if you felt it as well, that because you have gone out there and you're viewed in a particular way and you've taken on in people's minds a particular persona, you are this guy, you are the, you use the phrase intellectual dark web or you said this about UFOs or you said this about theoretical physics and that's a persona and everyone expects you to play that part and that can become a trap sometimes because obviously at all times you're much more than any of those things and you're changing your mind constantly. How, how do you, as a public figure, how, how do you sort of deal with that? It's interesting. I, I think I was the person who worried about this most visibly first. And I pushed the concept of audience capture. There's a great phrase I heard from it from, from Gurvinder Bhogal called the looking glass self, mm. where you fashion yourself from the reflection that you see in the eyes of others. So I think that there's that, and then there's the uh, funhouse mirror self, which is what I really dislike, where your audience, particularly the audience that is motivated to hunt you, attempts to fit you into a very simplistic figure, and then they go around trying to get everyone else to see you as they see you, as the contorted circus freak that they're trying to create from you. And that's much more destructive because then you end up doing things to show you that you aren't the circus freak. But very often, you weren't being freakish to begin with. They were just kind of cognitively priming everyone. You'll notice he says the word the over and over again. Like, yeah, everybody does. <laughs> but every time he says the word the, he's actually thinking about murder. So you can, you, you can leave a suggestion and then it appears to be self-validating. I worry a lot about that. In terms of audience capture... I always looked to these two figures, David Bowie and Madonna, who constantly changed their persona. So they had a series of avatars over, over a career. And I thought that they got it right. That the right way to do this is to 
constantly morph and change. I'm not exactly sure, to be entirely honest, how the world sees me. And I don't think it sees me in one particular way, because what you start to realize is that there are these inferential clusters. And the inferential cl clusters will say uh, that they will read everything the same way based on client side architecture. So for example, every time that you are saying something, they might say, oh, that was incredibly insightful. Or they might say, wow, you always feel the need to be incredibly insightful even when you have nothing. Okay. So those are two different inferential clusters. My sense is that my audience breaks into a, a bunch of these, and I really wish that most of them wouldn't project into such low-dimensional kind of typology. And this is what really bothers me. Oh, yeah, you're a long-form long public intellectual. Well, what did you just say? I mean, did, did you say that uh, Christopher Hitchens and Noam Chomsky are basically the same person? I, I have no idea what you're actually doing, but it's somehow very threatening to you that there are a lot of interesting individuals. And so you're desperately trying to make the world less interesting. So that's a, that's a really interesting behavior pattern that I wasn't aware of before I started putting myself forward, is that there are a lot of people who are threatened by the variety of different types of people in the world. And they're constantly trying to say, can I just get you to be one thing? Can I just get you to be, you're the UFO guy. You're the science guy. You're the rebel guy. You're the this guy. You're the that guy. I just find it very strange that there's a large portion of humanity that wants you to be boring. And and just looking at the internet, looking at what social media has done, I sometimes think that on the fringes, at the extremes, there are vocal minorities that seem to be much larger than they are because they're shouting all the time. Yeah. But there's a silent majority of people out there who are curious, who want to listen, who are sure. not shoving that label on you, but who are susceptible to the labels uh, projected by the vocal minorities, but who are not necessarily projecting those on you themselves. So how do you decide who you're speaking to? No one knows. Like, None of us know. This issue of these incredibly annoying people who seem to have nothing else to do with their time other than to hound and hunt the reason that they do what they do is that it's effective in scaring normal people so i've sometimes called them uh, intellectual or social border collies where they're trying to make sure that no no sheep go stray and in particular reddit is really bad i don't know why i thought twitter was really bad well reddit's worse i think reddit the point of reddit very often is, you know, that thing that you think is great. I, I never fell for that. <laughs> you know, it's like anything that you find great. Somebody's there to tell you, yeah, I saw right through that. <laughs> and well, did, did you see, did you see right through a child's smile? Did you see through a summer's day? Did you, did, did you see right through your own first kiss? How, how, who hurt you and why? Why? How do we get you help? Is there some medication you could take so that you don't screw yourself out of life saying, I didn't fall for that thing that happened? Well, you know, in the immortal words of Green Day, I hope you had the time of your life. It's a, uh, uh, yeah, and the song is called Good Riddance, which is exactly what one feels about these guys. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, fall for something, be seduced. Be seduced. Open your freaking heart to believe in something. When somebody tells you, ha, you know, that person is a, is a dumb versions person of a smart person or, a, you know, an ugly person's version of a beautiful person or whatever. Just have the courage to say, actually, I think they're pretty smart. I think that person's gorgeous. I really, really appreciate that cringe thing that really started out as an earnest hope. Like, Sometimes I support Lex Friedman in this. I just think, you know what? It's really simplistic, this idea that it's all about love. And I'm, I'll stand behind my friend. I don't think it's all about love. But if he wants to say that it's all about love, I think it's a beautiful sentiment. And 
Oh, so you fell for that? Yeah, I did. And your point? Get out of the way. I run a WhatsApp group that has a few hundred of my writing students and one of the rules I have set is you are not allowed to shit on anyone. No negativity. So that typical Twitter thing that you take a screenshot and mm. you shit on someone. No, we're going to be the opposite of Twitter. Every day is a group hug. Just, you know, be positive, support each other. Like, is this a modern pathology? The pathology of constantly shitting on others to show how virtuous and knowledgeable you yourself are. I mean, I understand that the tendency that it's, you know, like Steven Pinker said, nature gives you knobs, nurture turns them. And I guess we always had the knobs for this. I haven't but, heard that. That's interesting. Yeah, but did social media turn those knobs really hard? Yeah, it does. I, I think it does a lot. And I think it has to do with the fact that certain things are not comfortable on social media. So for example, do you, are you familiar with the singer Tracy Chapman? Of course. Tracy Chapman's lyrics are really bad, often. But she used to sing on the streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you'd walk right past her. And okay, she, had a, she has a voice that can animate the lyrics and make them profound and genius and beautiful. And if you subtracted her voice, you'd be embarrassed. So sometimes the key question is, can you animate something and make it believable? You know? There are various poses that I think are very funny where a woman can pose in a particular way, but if a man were to pose that way, the fourth wall would shatter instantaneously and we'd all laugh. And so in part, it's a question to committing to a bit can you commit to a bit and make us believe? I think that every song is like this. I think that if you take a three-minute song, it only works if the singer can inhabit the song and create that theatrical state where you don't actually question the lyrics. My wife pointed out that the song, I Can't Stand the Rain, Against My Window, Bringing Back Sweet Memories, it's a beautiful song, but then it contains the unfortunate line, hey, window pane, do you remember how sweet life used to be? <laughs> Nobody in the history of the world has said, hey, window pane. Uh, a, that's a terrible line. It's a terrible line. But if you can commit to that and make it wonderful, that's great art, right? In part, the key point is, can you cause us not to see the blemishes? Can you carry something off? And... I remember there was a movie. I can't remember what it was called. Well, there have been a few of this type where you, an actress plays an unattractive woman who's irresistible. It's a very hard role to carry off, to be both unattractive and irresistible. But I love the fact that that's possible. Yeah, and you know, I love Tracy Chapman's fast car, so I was just trying to imagine it in someone else's voice. I think after this, I'm going to go on YouTube and look for covers and see what it sounds like. But I guess with any song, it's a whole damn package that has to work together. Right. So the lyrics can sometimes be really banal and cliched as, you know, can happen. But it's just a package of the music and the words and, and just the feel that the the musician sort of imbues them with. and. You know, you're a guitarist. Do you feel that there is, uh, like, you n not a guitarist, you're a musician. You played a lot of music. I'm not. Um, but you played a lot of music. I, you, ha you have a piano tuner story. You, you've, you've got videos where you're playing I, the harmonica. I play and the guitar. at a lot of different instruments. But the fact that I don't call myself a musician is not about modesty. It's about the fact that I can't sit down at an instrument, commit to a bit, and dependably move you. You see, one of the things that's really important about making a mistake in music is can you recover from it so that the person stays in that held mode where they, they believe temporarily, just the way you believe when you go to a movie. You forget that you're in a movie. I can't pull that off, and I may never be able to pull that off. It may be that I know a bunch of songs or I can play them, and but I so admire a person who steps forward and says, I'm about to do something and you're going to believe for four minutes. I wish I could do that. 
That's my, that's a, that's an aspiration. Yeah, you've you've quoted Jonathan Richman of the Modern Lovers saying, you know, <laughs> strip away the drums, strip away the whatever, strip away everything. But this, this we have to play, be able to play with our instruments broken and it's raining. Yeah, and and there's something beautiful there about just capturing the essence of something and that being everything, just beyond the the mechanistic stuff. Have you ever heard this cuckoo? I forget what coil. I mean the bird, yeah. What does it sound like? I mean, isn't the name onomatopic? So I guess it would sound cuckoo. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It sounds to me like the opening of the B-52's Planet Claire. Okay. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, oh, oh. She came from Planet Claire. So I was just thinking about, like, how funny it is to be walking through Mumbai and hearing... The Planet, hearing Planet Claire about to start because it's mango season. Wow. Yeah. Let's go back to your childhood, early days, whatever. What I'm interested in knowing is how did you form the frames through which you look at the world? Like part of what is happening is, of course, you travel, you come to India in 86, you, you're moving yeah. around, you're more open perhaps to experiences. But I think one of the struggles that we all have growing up and going through those years is we are firstly forming ourselves, like figuring out who we are and how we look at the world sure. and what we want to do with our lives. And second of all, also fighting off what I think eventually for most people becomes a lifelong anxiety yeah. of the looking glass self, what others think of you and sure. all of that. You know, today when one speaks to you, one sees your interviews on YouTube and all of that, it's a formed person with a formed this thing. Give me a sense of the unformed you. Give me a sense of that that shaping that happened in your life. What are the things that shaped you? You know, what, what do you feel when you look back at? Look, I was a upper middle class Jewish kid from LA uh, with professional parents. I mean, okay, it's a small community, but it's not it's not unheard of. Nothing that interesting. I think that there was a fall from grace when I was in fourth grade. I was on top of the world. I was very, very good in, in school. And then I, as a result, I skipped fifth grade. But I was in fifth grade for a month before they skipped me. And I started plummeting. But they were basing the skipping of the grade on my fourth grade performance. So I skipped the year that I started to fail. And in sixth grade, I completely fell apart. And from sixth grade through 12th grade and then for the first year of college, I was useless. And so it's sort of like, you know, there are all these stories about somebody being a noble person and then uh, being a commoner and then their, their nobility is rediscovered. There's no question of that because I came from sort of shtetl, tra shtetl trash in the Ukraine. But I've been seen as smart and then I got put in the dummy corner for a long time. And I think that was that was probably pretty formative that in essence I had the sense of okay because writing and reading have gotten really intensive and there's some problem in the writing and reading channel that is not present in the listening and speaking channel. I had this weird fact that I was a I, I had been young for my grade and I got skipped. And I was failing. So that was weird. Why is a guy who's sort of a year and a half ahead in school bad at school? And I had, I had a grandfather who was probably seen as being potentially the smartest person in the four families that were all related to each other, but, we, but also the least successful. And so he was sort of the failed but internally acknowledged to be the smart failed person in the family. And I was his grandson and he never finished college, but he was a chemist and he had patents, but he didn't have the, the credential. And so I always viewed it as like, okay, we're the screw ups in the family, but we're also the bright shining stars. And I took that myth very seriously. 
And in part, maybe the Harvard PhD in the hardest subject, like the hardest place, the hardest, the highest degree in the hardest subject, sort of a thank you to my grandfather. It's like, no, we, we were stripped of who we were by the system. And I saw you and you taught me all this great stuff. And this is for you. Did you always have that self-belief or were there times during this where, you, you know, you... Okay, it wasn't true. It's a lie. It's a performance in a certain sense. But that's what, that's what life is. If you ask, am I good enough to be a podcaster, you're not. I mean, seriously, what do you have that nobody else has? Why, why are we doing this? No, it's, it's, a, it's a violent act of self-assertion to do this. And I said, no, I'm really good at math. I wasn't. But I was, but I wasn't. People don't understand this, you know? It's like, if the only person allowed to say anything on the guitar is Eddie Van Halen, what are all those bands doing? You know, it, you have to basically assert something that isn't true. People always say, oh, but you mean fake it till you make it. That doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't scratch the surface. This was a violent act of assertion. I meant to, to, to understand theoretical physics. Well, why should you be allowed to understand theoretical physics when you can't do mathematics, when you're not good in school? Oh, because that doesn't count. It doesn't matter. And this is what I really want to tell people, which is this Dunning-Kruger stuff is a joke. It's an intermediate stage where you doubt yourself into inaction. No, go assert something that's wrong. You want to know one of the hardest things in the world? Putting myself forward on guitar. Take a look at who follows me on Instagram. You know, Joe Bonamassa. Joe Robinson. I think uh, you played with Jeff Beck as well. <laughs> I didn't. Tosin Abasi. Uh, the monsters of guitar follow me, and sometimes they leave comment like, great chops, Eric, keep going. And I just think, look, we all know where I am on guitar. You can't hide. These guys love me in part because they're having a question. They're so good. Why is the guitar on hard times? I love what they do. I, I, I believe in them. And they care about what I think and they want to jam with me. And, and I, I look to the guitar community and I say, look, if you're a young woman and you're not confident in your appearance and you can get the supermodels to follow you, they'll cheer you on. You want to know who's going to not cheer you on and tell you, ooh, that's cringe, dude, you suck. It's the people one or two steps below that. Right? And my feeling about that is make a very clear decision whether you want to listen to the B minus critics, because the B minus critics are pretty well informed. Dude, you blew the timing. You, you said the same thing three times in the space of a minute on guitar. You're just letting your fingers talk. Hey, do you want lessons? Like you'll find these comments all the time when I post something about music. And never from the best people. Best people offer me lessons. And so in, in part, my feeling is just try to inspire us and make, a, make, a, make one decision. You're either going to listen to the B-minus players who are pissed and angry about why, why you're making it and they're not, or not. listen to them or don't. But if you listen to them, I can tell you how your life's going to work out. I actually think in many ways, self-delusion is an adaptive feature you needed to get ahead because, you know, I encounter this situation with many of the young writers I work with where there will be a mismatch sometimes between their judgment and their ability. So they'll write something and they'll think it's crap. And that generally means their judgment is ahead of their ability. And with a little work, their ability can catch up. And to me, it's a positive sign. It means you want to continue. But when I look at myself in my 20s, yeah. m both my judgment and my ability was shit. So I was a bad writer and I thought I was good. But where that worked for me 
is that it gave me the dunning kruger confidence to just continue faking it till i made it yeah. and then you iterate enough and you're there so here's a crazy idea that we could push <laughs> out there dunning and kruger right into my veins right D- don't don't dabble in dunning and kruger because then you're just going to make everybody angry but if you're going to help yourself to some dunning kruger you better mainline that thing and have a blast <laughs> <laughs> yeah and is it then also the tragic case and i think you've alluded to something like this in one of your past interviews is it then also the tragic case that because men are more likely to be self delusional and full of this false confidence while women often suffer from the imposter syndrome and are more diffident about putting themselves out forward that a lot of women get lost in this game that men and women may often start out in the same place in terms of ability or talent or wherever they're going mm. but the women just don't fake it till they make it they drop out of the race yeah, you know i i wonder sometimes about that whether or not it's really a question about they they're they're more social in a certain sense and they're more conscious of the criticism probably but i also think that a lot of them don't like conflict and a lot of men thrive on conflict and so i i worry about the number of great insights that are locked inside female minds where the owner of the mind says it's not worth battling it out i know i'm right i know there's something here why would i want to spend 3 years making myself crazy to prove a point There there was a video that I found of a guy who jumps down 20 stairs with a skateboard and lands the trick. Maybe it flips, I can't remember. And he starts off with this beautiful jump. And then it winds back through the year. The first time he did it and lost his teeth. and then you see the ho- the ambulance going to the hospital cuz he twists his leg or whatever it is and it's just one year of self punishment and it culminates in the thing that you saw at the beginning <laughs> which is he lands the trick and it, i was like i was thinking as a man how do you compete with men it's really hard to compete with anything that pigheadish and stupid that's going <laughs> to yeah. spend a year abusing itself for 20 seconds of footage. So my feeling about this is that we should encourage men to use their taste for conflict to liberate great thoughts of females who may not feel like going through all of that that pain and anguish. With respect to with respect to looks though there's a different issue i personally think that women are just brutal to each other and there's all this talk about the sisterhood but i watch women undermine each other particularly like oh she thinks she's all that she thinks she's so beautiful she it's like no go off and be the center of attention we all want it We want you to be the center of attention. We want you to revel in the fact that you look fantastic. And and I'm not talking about the fact that you're a 10. I want a 6 to look fantastic and glow. And we'll cheer you on. It's it, it's your fellow females who are the ones who are undermining you. And you know what a 6 who feels like a 10 is a 10. Well, we 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 can get like that. But I don't, I don't even want to get like that. Yeah, I mean. Okay, so you're a 6, but your face is lit up. I mean you ever see like what is it Bethany Hamilton? Nope. Hot chick who lost her arm to a shark. Like literally a surfer who just she lost an arm. And she got back out there and kept surfing. I I don't know what's hotter than that, you know? I mean it's just like people who are full of life are so scarce. If you want to compete and win in the game of love, just turn up just turn yourself as bright as you can get get in touch with your narcissism and and not the path- pathological form of narcissism just try loving yourself because we we were so awash in people who hate themselves and and are beating each other up that mostly i just want to be inspired 
you know, I, I have one little girl who I'm very sweet on who has a, a birth deformity. I was about seven. And this is one of the most beautiful girls in the world, literally physically, but just there's a very clear birth deformity. And she's going to be, she's going to be, she's going to be absolutely fine in life. I have just no question because she just sparkles everywhere she goes. And if she can do that, you, I, I guarantee most everybody else can, can do some form of this and be fine too. You know, being an overthinker, I sometimes find it really hard within myself to find that spark of life or even to really love myself. Yeah. How has the journey been for you? Have you, you know, like, when did you get comfortable in your own skin? When did you start kind of saying that, like, this is who I am. I'm going to own this. I'm going to own me. I'm happy the way well, I am. Well, you, you never get there. I mean, certainly when I have a self-doubt and then some idiot in the comment section plays on that self-doubt. I feel like, oh, crap. Because I find that some of the worst people on the, that you encounter on the internet are actually some of the most perceptive. And part of their problem is that they perceive all the world's worst stuff. Like, imagine that you had a nose that could tell whether there was anything wrong in your environment. So no meal is ever tasting good. So, you, okay, congratulations. You, you figured out how to, how to detect any la lack of cleanliness or putrid food or whatever. In part, you know, my feeling about this is you never actually completely get over it. But if I need to pick myself up, I, I'll stand up for a friend who's facing a mob. Every time there's a mob attacking a friend and I have a chance to say, yeah, I think he's great. And so, no, sh she's not having a problem. You're having a problem. I feel good about myself, you know, because it's dangerous and it's stupid, but it's decent. And... I think that there are things that you can always do to pick yourself up to, to, to know, you know, volunteer, volunteer to, to help somebody less fortunate than you. One of the things I get the most pleasure out of in life is at holiday time saying, I'm, I want to make five or 10 or two calls to followers who might not be having a good holiday season. So if, if you're having a bit of trouble, send me your number. And I'd like to have a, a call. Sometimes I'll have 20 minutes. Sometimes I'll have three hours with somebody. And that's available to everyone all the time. You know, you can just say, I have a little bit of extra strength. Who's in need? Who needs a cup of sugar? Who needs, who needs, a, who needs a liter of flour or whatever it is? You know, you can just offer something to the world. Sugar is poison. What? Sugar is poison. Are you kidding me? Sugar is absolute. <laughs> anyway, I'm, you, I'm, just, I'm, you just served me a, a great Indian cup of chai. Yeah, but I myself had a black coffee without sugar. <laughs> well, I had the black coffee without sugar. What I am saying is you always have the ability to give something of yourself. And so when you're feeling low and you're feeling empty and you just want somebody to fill your tank, you can weirdly fill your own tank by <laughs> finding it to give something to somebody else who's in even worse shape than you are. Because I guarantee you there's always somebody who's worse in worse shape than you. Yeah. That's a beautiful sentiment. And is it something you discovered along the way? How did, like, how did you discover it? Uh, Tim O'Reilly was really helpful. I was at a conference called Saifu in 2011. And it's sort of like 300 people, a lot of Nobel Prize winners, some billionaires, some very prominent scientists, and some people nobody would ever heard of, graduate students or writers that were on small struggling blogs. And Fu stood for Friends of O'Reilly. And Tim had made a lot of money. And I don't always have the easiest time with Tim. But he got up at a microphone the end of this conference. And he said, it's come to my attention that a lot of you guys are hurting. And he said, I, I can barely get through this story. How can I help? How can we help? There are a lot of people here with a lot of resources. There's a microphone. Come to the microphone. Tell us what you need. I thought, are you crazy? Can you imagine that? Like you have billionaires and you have people who are like shit out of luck. And the rich are inviting the shit out of luck to come to a microphone and say, what do you need? 
I, I'd never seen anything like it. And I've never gotten the confidence to do that. You know, once or twice I've said something like that and somebody says, can you send me 10,000 bucks? <laughs> and I just think that's not what happened to Tim. What happened to Tim was people moderated their own needs. It, it was so inspiring that we talk about the giving community when we talk about philanthropy. And it's a terrible name. But it brings up an interesting issue, which is taking. When a guy comes to your village, some point I did a trek in the Himalayas. And I think we went in over the Margon Pass and we went out over the Bakhtal Glacier into Ladakh. And it was at a time in the mid 80s where these villages were completely cut off. And with my white skin, people brought forward their relatives. I mean, there's no exaggeration what I'm about to say. And they would say, can you cut this tumor out of my, my mom? Can you, can you heal my cousin? Can you give sight to my uncle? And I was just thinking like, I'm a mathematics graduate student and, and I've, I've got a Swiss army knife and white skin and you want me to operate on your, on your relative. It was just crazy. Well, what if you showed up in one of these villages and you did glaucoma surgery and you restored sight and the ability of a person to go from being a drain on their family to being an earner for their family? Is it unreasonable to ask that you name a child after whoever organized the surgeons who do the cleft lip or who restore sight or any of this stuff? Those of us who take need to take better care of those who give because we're not closing the loop. And you have this thing called donor fatigue. And donor fatigue sets in when the donor is just seen as just a source. Well, what more can you give? What more can you give? It's wrong. So in a certain sense, I think we're afraid because the culture of taking, you've seen this in India. Somebody shows up at a house and they say, boy, what a gorgeous painting that is. And the owner of the house says, what? What? You know the story. I don't know the story. But oh. We'll see. oh, that thing? Please take it. Oh, it's been cluttering up our house for forever. And the American says, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, sure. And then, you know, and by the way, that it's a beautiful jug. Yeah, absolutely. If you have room for it, put it in your luggage. And you, the person leaves and says, I can't believe that person took all our stuff. Well, why was that? Because there was a culture of hospitality that wasn't understood, right? Which is if you admire something, the, the owner offers it. And then the person's supposed to refuse and you're supposed to know not to admire in the wrong way, all, all that kind of stuff. We need to get better at sharing strength. And I think that what I hadn't seen was is that Tim O'Reilly... By the way, I'm I'm not sure because I didn't get much sleep last night. If I said Bill O'Reilly, that was wrong. Before. You said Tim O'Reilly. I said Tim O'Reilly. Okay, Tim O'Reilly inspired people to moderate their needs and their wants to what they really needed and what they really wanted and what could be done. And I, I think that that was the thing that inspired that in me. I've never gotten to the level that Tim O'Reilly got to, but the idea of just saying I have some strength, who's in need, probably really got catalyzed by that moment. I wish it was original to me, but it wasn't. No, it's it's a beautiful, moving story. What did you need when you most needed something? Oh, Jesus. That's not a, that's not a fair thing. Uh, to be seen. I can't believe that we pretend that we can't see unusual minds that don't fit. So I had an unusual mind. That's supposed to be a great thing. But then, you know, more or less, I would say from the time I was 10 to about 17, all school was just daily abuse. Just the teachers knew I was smart. And they still like, okay, we have to punish you because you failed yet again today. And I, I don't think people have any idea what the aggregate effect 
of getting up every morning to be told you're a moron is just because you have learning issues. And what's more, I, all I wanted for my children was to have these learning issues. I wanted them to have the problem because the problem is actually a negative externality of a learning superpower. You know, it's very funny. We have this thing called attention deficit disorder. And do you know what it results in? It results in somebody being able to stay focused on the same problem with laser focus for weeks. And we call it attention deficit disorder. In what world does that make sense? Yes, the person may not be interested in what you're saying. So that person isn't interested in what you're saying, and you call that a disorder. But the person is building something in their basement and doing nothing else. And so it's it's attention deficit because they find you boring. So this is where I started talking about teaching disabilities. And that really rocked people's world. Which is my learning disabilities are not real. Your teaching disabilities are severe. Let's talk about your teaching disabilities. Teachers did not appreciate that. And I don't know what to do about that. I don't know why we allow so many bad people to become teachers. There was this poll I saw on Twitter a while back, which kind of the results took me by surprise. Mm. And the poll, I think, was, if I'm not mistaken, by someone named Gad Saad. I, sorry if I mispronounce the name. But the poll really was, if you could choose only one of the two, one of these two, which one would you choose? And it was to be liked and to be respected. Yeah. And my mind boggled because 95% of the people chose respected. Yeah. And I thought like, oh my fucking God, because I would just choose the other option in a flash. I didn't understand that. Well, in, in part, the poll isn't fair because it signals that liked is to be is shallow and respected is deep. And so I don't know that I think that the poll was actually well constructed. I mean, I know, I know Gad, but it also conjures a different question, which everyone knows, which is it better to be liked or to be feared. And because so few of us have a sense of, you know, we're liked and we're not liked. But almost nobody's respected. Who do, who do you think we all respect? Have you ever seen universal respect? I think respect is kind of contextual. Universal respect, I think, is actually impossible because the world is so splintered. Sure. But I'm talking about... Have you ever seen a, an orgy of respect? I think no one hates a great poet. Who's a great poet? Mary Oliver, Mark Strand... When was the last time you saw tens of thousands of people come out? Actually, right now, as we're recording in the last few days, I mean, yeah. this is, this, I, I, and I don't know if only I'm seeing this or I'm noticing it particularly yeah. sharply or it's really happening, but I feel that there is an upsurge of affection for good poems that is coming along. Sure. And it's contextual because it's within the kind of people who like a kind of poetry. But you will never find haters there. There's absolutely no one who's going to say, hey, Mary Oliver well, sucks. I don't know. I mean, it, Actually, there will be now that we will, put it out there. there <laughs> but, yeah. um, I saw this thing once in my life. When Nelson Mandela was freed... And he came to the U.S. There was an enormous response. People just wanted to be in his presence. Now, this was a guy who was jailed and could have gotten out at any moment. All he needed to do was renounce violence. And it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. He wouldn't renounce violence. And people so respected the idea that he stayed in jail voluntarily to have his spirit broken, that they thronged the banks of the River Charles in Boston just to see this man. And he spoke in a kind of a weird, hesitant way. I think that we have so moved away from respectability that we don't really appreciate what it's like to see people just super energized 
And of course, the local example with which I'm obsessed is uh, what happened during the emergency. and There was only one guy to turn to. That was weird, right? Because most of the founders figured out how to get rich, how to get powerful. And one guy stayed true to the plan. And there was, there was a need for a someone. And I, I've called this the break glass in case of emergency person. You were talking earlier about how so many bad people become teachers. And equally, you know, I, I earlier used to think that social media brings out the worst side of people. But now I think it also empowers the worst among us. But a counter to that way of thinking about the world actually comes from thinking about generosity from something you were saying earlier. Yeah. My friend Prem Panikar once told me this really moving story. I think he, along with Paul Salopek and a couple of others, they were on this long walk through India. Paul Salopek was walking a bunch of continents, but Prem was walking with him through India, and at one point, they reached this village, and they were given shelter in um, the home of this person who was there, who then disappeared for two hours. And they were wondering what happened, where's he gone, what's the matter? And then the guy came back with a meal for them. And they discovered that this guy, because they were guests, wanted to feed them chicken, wanted to feed them a good meal. So he mm. went to the money lender to buy mm. to borrow money so he could buy a chicken and he could get it for them. And uh, I mean, the story, I don't remember the specific details, but it's something of this. And I've heard so many, like countless stories mm. of generosity from strangers yeah. across cultures hell yeah who will just fucking help isn't it amazing right and and i and that makes me think about the human spirit because if you go on social media if you look at all the shouting that's happening you might think that fuck you know human nature is ugly it's yeah. messed up but then there is this also and it's like magical i had my life saved on the margon pass up north my friend and i set out on this trek and I don't know, we, we, were in, we were invincible. And we got up to this place with just our sweaters, and suddenly nightfall fell, and we couldn't see anything. And we were on this rock. I remember being on this rock, and this rock was like precipitous and at an angle. And there was, it was like a moonless night. And we were starting to freeze, and we had no idea where we are. And we had to grip onto this rock to stay on this rock. And we realized we just screwed ourselves really badly. And um, after like, I don't know, a couple of hours, we start hearing this enormous ruckus. And somewhere there's like horses or something. And we see some kind of disturbance around us and, we hear this, and we shout out, we go, Salam Aleichum. And the voice <laughs> says, Aleichum Vassalam, and goes past us. We're like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody could have saved us, and they didn't save us, and now we're still stuck on this rock trying not to go to sleep so we don't fall on them. Suddenly, these two guys show up, and they're barefoot. And they demand our packs. And like, we don't know what to do. So now we're going to have no, none of our stuff. And these two thieves are going to steal all our stuff. So they, they take all our stuff and they run off. And I look at Adil and I say, what do we do? He's like, we have to catch them. So <laughs> all we can see is these two guys. And we're running behind these thieves we don't know if they're armed to try to get our packs back. And at least they lead us off the rock because we can't see anything. And finally, we're just about to catch up to them. And there's a village or an encampment or something. And they turn around and they hand us our packs back. We can't figure out what, what's, did, did, did we scare them with our prowess? Or, I mean, clearly they're adapted to this environment. We're not. No, they were saving our lives. And uh, they didn't want to humiliate us by carrying our packs into the village, into the encampment. Wow. Yeah? And 
So they allowed us the fiction of walking into the encampment as men who had carried their own packs. And we, we got into this, uh, into this hut situation. And they, they, there was all this food that they offered to us. And there was some ugly piece of meat, like the ugliest, most disgusting part of an animal you could imagine. It was the only meat that there was. And they presented it to us. And I said to Adil, how do I refuse this piece of meat? He says, with your white skin, you can't. He says, you have to eat this. I said, well, you're eating it too. He says, hey man, <laughs> I don't have white skin. So anyway, I'm eating what must have been like the cartilage of some nose of an ox or I don't know what. And we're talking to these guys who are you? And they said, we, we are the teachers of the Warwan Valley. Uh, and Adil's sort of doing the Urdu to English translation. It probably wasn't Urdu, something. And I said, well, what do you teach? So he asked the question. And uh, I said, the war teachers of the Warwan Valley can teach anything. And I mm -hmm. said, like animal husbandry? And then he asked the question, and, and then they came back and they said, Anything. Except animal husbandry. <laughs> anyway, we uh, we had a hell of a night, and everybody was toasting each other, and there was a lot of good goodwill. And then we fell asleep in the in this hut, and the next morning, we woke up. They they were like all ready to go. And they were gone. It was the most dramatic thing to be in. The, in the, in, in the Himalayas and see the, just the size as we, cause we hadn't seen anything. We just climbed up st like morons under this pass. And then to see just the sheer scope of the scale of this thing. And we had several more sort of like really dumb incidences. You, you can get yourself in a lot of trouble up there. But anyway, the thought that I wanted to share was anybody who survived their own travels in, in places like this has usually done so because there's just this pathological streak of generosity and goodness that you find when you're when you're walking the world. And I wonder when we think about the design of the world, and I'll go back to Pinker's quote about nature gives us knobs, nurture turns them. And I think about the ways in which these knobs are turned. And obviously we have good knobs and bad knobs. Yeah. And it's clear to me the different ways in which say social media has amplified many of these bad knobs you know the facebook like button the twitter retweet amplifying the desire for validation the need for status the tribalism all of those things you know mm -hmm. what are the ways and i think about this often what are the ways in which we can turn the good knobs you know what are the designs that can help us accomplish that like i understand that the like button and the retweet button were never meant to amplify yeah. these well, norms. They easy. were meant for engagement. But how do we, uh, you know, but if we are now to look back at hindsight and look at all of that and say that without compromising on a platform's desire to increase engagement and all of that, how do we amplify the good norms? Stand for something. It's, it's, it's very easy. You know, my friend Joe Rogan got into a lot of trouble because his enemies put together a real of every time he had said the dreaded N word, you know, and, and there had become a rule, which is if you say that word, those syllables, and you're not black, then you have to be destroyed. Now it's a really interesting thing because it's a horrible word, but one of the uses of that horrible word is not horrible at all, which is it's used for in-grouping the outsider by black Americans. So Joe had been in the comedy circuit and some of those brilliant minds in comedy have always been, been black. So Joe got very comfortable with this word being ingrouped by many of his fellow comedians. And so he used it and he used it across a time when nobody was using it anymore. So there, there's my friend indefensibly using this word over many years. And I, I didn't know what to do. The one thing I could do is I could post a picture with my arm around him and just say any questions. I wasn't going to use the word. I wasn't going to make a point of it. Just like, we all know what you're doing. You're trying to destroy another human being who doesn't deserve to be destroyed. Stand up to a mob. Stand up for something beautiful that you believe in. Everybody has the ability. When somebody says, oh, that's so cringe, you can say, oh, sorry you see it that way. I, I freaking love it. 
Stand for, stand for something. And, and it's addictive, right? Because sooner or later, what you realize is you, you'll meet a spouse because you were willing to stand for something. You'll get a job. Like the world will shit on you. It'll make you hate the day you were born. But there'll be three people who are watching. And one of them is going to be your future spouse. And one of them is going to be your future employer. One of them is going to be your next big break. Just the world is afraid to stand up for anything. And master that one skill and you'll never go hungry. You'll never hurt for companionship. Your life will not be de devoid of romance. Just, just that one thing. I think it's a really easy thing. And to be honest with you, I have a family member in a little bit of a medical situation, and I'm going to go visit that person now. It's been fantastic visiting with you, Amit, and I can't wait to continue the next time I'm uh, locally in town. Yeah, this was a lovely conversation. Thank you so much. Before you go, a final question, I'll ask, which will take Please. no time at all. Uh, it's a custom on the show for me and my listeners. Recommend books, music, films, which in your life have given you joy, so majority want to share it with everyone. Hmm. Well, The Great Brain is a completely seditious book to give a child about having your own moral co code when the moral code of the society around you has failed. So I'd recommend that to somebody raising a kid. If you've got girls, Pippi Longstocking is a completely seditious book for a child. I also recommend giving them the completely outrageous songs of Tom Lehrer, which are age inappropriate. Try to get them to your kids as early as possible, filled with prostitution, drug references, and the like. Uh, you won't regret it. But I would recommend finding my analysis of the movie Kung Fu Panda on Quora. That's masterful. We didn't get a chance to discuss it perhaps next time, but it's I masterful. Look, I think it's one of the greatest films of modern times. I think people don't understand it because they pretend that it's a children's cartoon when it's anything but. I think your explanation is uh, <laughs> perhaps the best part of it, but never mind. Get well, it. you know, that explanation brought me a great friendship with Glenn Berger, one of the two screenwriters, wow. because I shared it on the Tim Fair. The, my first podcast, which I didn't know what a podcast was, and that, that changed my life because he got on Twitter and said, I wish we had had this analysis while we were writing it. <laughs> and it told me the power of the medium. Let me just also say this, that podcasting is about to explode in India, if I'm not wrong. And it's a pleasure to be on one of the ones that uh, people around Bombay, Mumbai have been recommending as uh, they said, you know, you really want to talk to somebody who might be the Lex Friedman of India. And of course you're not, you're, you're your own thing. So maybe Lex Friedman uh, is the Amit of, of India. No, no, he's but, great. He's fantastic. But what I would say is we need a new vision. And I'm not sure whether either of the two major parties in India is the right vision. If, an, if a great vision is going to emerge wouldn't it be great if it started to emerge organically out of the fact that it's very hard to stop podcasts because the RSS feed is hard to kill. And I really appreciate with no particular agenda being invited in a, in a country that is not my own, a culture that's not my own, just to speak. And, you know, if I failed you, if I failed to understand your context here locally, uh, that's on me. But this could be something great. This could be one of the absolute great markets for freedom of thought, freedom of speech, for creativity. And if I had one wish, by the way, for India, it's stop looking to the West for validation and figure out what it is that can be done over here that at the moment the West is having plenty of troubles of its own thinking its way out of a paper bag. It would be great to get a boost from this many brilliant people in, under one roof. Well, thanks a lot of, for taking so much time off on what I know is a busy day for you. I really enjoyed our conversation and all of your insights. And I don't know if we need a new vision, but I know we need to talk. So thank you for coming here, Eric. Thanks for having me, Amit.
If you enjoyed listening to this episode, check out the show notes, enter rabbit holes at will. You can follow Eric on Twitter at Eric R. Weinstein. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Seen and the Unseen at seenunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Seen and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to seenunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.